Uh, I know, I know. Uh, I am aware of the impossibility that my chosen title implies. Uh, I felt the exact same confusion upon hearing my orders. But bear with me if you would. Hopefully, it'll come to make some sense. My hair is whipped finally back from my head with a blast of the frozen wind as the helicopter ascends, lifting itself up and off the arctic ground before the door has even fully closed. I grimace with the lurch in my stomach, muttering a quick prayer as we leave the earth behind. I'm not particularly religious, but I'll admit it. I'm scared. You find me at the tail end of a confusing and chaotic 24 hours. Yesterday morning, my military routine was disrupted by my superior superior, and I was deliberately separated from the rest of my squadron. I was informed that I would be taking a brief hiatus from the NATO Rapid Reaction Corps here in Norway, and would be temporarily relocated to a coalition-based outpost in the Ural Mountains. The Ural, sir? I had replied. But that's in Russia, isn't it? That's right, he said levelly. NATO-Russian coalition. NATO-Russian coalition. I considered the existence of such a coalition incredibly unlikely, especially considering certain current geopolitical circumstances. And yet, here I am, on board a Royal Norwegian Air Force helicopter, departing from the airbase at Bardafoss and in transit to the base at Orland, where one of NATO's finest will fly me directly into Russian airspace across the country and towards the Urals, the mountain range that marks the border between European and Asian Russia. I feel sick, and not just because of the choppiness of the flight. I suffer through it. We arrive in Orland. I am bustled from one means of transport to another, out from the helicopter and into a plane. Space enough inside for plenty, but aside from myself and the pilots, entirely empty. Another American? The pilot remarks as I clamber on board, pointing to the flag emblazoned across the arm of my uniform. He turns to his co-pilot and mutters something in Norwegian. I picked up a little of the language during my time in the country. I think he says something about a uh, one bet. Excuse me? I ask as I buckle myself into my seat. The pilot turns to look at me again over his shoulder. The last four were Americans, he says simply. I'd have thought they were overdue for a European by now. Canadian maybe. Adam Smith, yes? Yes, I reply. Yes, that's me. Good. Great. Well, here we go then, Adam. Fingers crossed we don't get shut down by any Moscow missiles, eh? He chuckles and turns back to the controls, failing to see the impact that his choke had had on my constitution. I still don't understand. I shout out above the rising roar of the engine. No one's telling me a damn thing. Why am I going to Russia? Why do we have people stationed in the Euros? And they're not spies, right? They're working with Russians? So what the hell is going on? The co-pilot shoots me a sympathetic look. Secret information, friend. Classified. We ferried the people to and fro, but that's all. He shifts and turns back to the runway ahead. But you're in for a rough couple of weeks, Smith. Maybe longer. Best of luck to you. And the aircraft begins its run between the mountains, clambering up and into the sky, in the snow like little stars in the dark as we soar up high between them. I watch the little blinking lights on the sides of the wings. It's early as hell, and the sun is still yet to rise. We soar through the darkness, and I settle into my seat, doing my best to try and grab a few hours of sleep. Not an easy thing to do when you're expecting to be blown out of the sky at any given second. Burns half to a crisp in the initial explosion caught amidst billowing flames and plumes of smoke, plummeting in freefall towards the ice and rock below. I scratch the side of my neck, shifting in my seat, 
To be honest, I'm not even sure that I'm supposed to be here. I happen to share the exact same name as another soldier on base, you see. A guy also named Adam Smith. In a further bizarrity, he was even born in the exact same town. Just a few years apart. And we've been mistaken for each other on numerous occasions. Not that we look anything alike, of course. I doubt that that even matters. We all look the same to the higher-ups. These misunderstandings have never been particularly consequential. And they've always been remedied pretty promptly once they were pointed out. Amusing to everyone else involved. Nothing quite like this has ever happened before. Ever. And I've never even noticed anyone disappearing from the base, despite what the pilot said. The last four were Americans. Why has nobody spoken about this before? Why is this the first time I'm hearing about a joint US-Russian base? A base in Russia? Surely not. It makes no strategic sense. It's downright dangerous. But I am unable to come up with any concrete, logical theories. And so, I spend the next few hours drifting in and out of bleary, unrestful sleep, tainted with disturbing dreams. The hours pass. The sun rises. And any real chance of sleep is lost. I drowsily watch through the window as the Euros appear beneath us, below the layer of cloud. We fly over it in a white arc, and the pilots begin our descent. Ears popping as we draw closer and closer to the side of a runway nestled amongst the mountains, attached to what looks like a very modest military installation. The wheels judder against the asphalt. The plane trundles to a gradual stop. My heart hammers. Russia. Well, the pilot says after a moment. This is your stop. He unfastens and steps out of the cockpit, stretching his legs. He pauses, and there is a poignant moment between us as he looks to me. Then, he holds out his hand. I shake it. Good luck, man. He says quietly. All traces of sleepiness are blasted back with a rush of wintry wind as the door clangs open. Jesus! I shout out into the gale, shielding my eyes from the wind and frost as I make my careful way down the steps towards the ground. I am greeted there by two men, one American and one Russian. I salute, and both salute in return. Saluted by a Russian, on Russian soil. The American mutters something in Russian to his partner, and then steps forward. Smith! He calls out, loud above the winds. Yes, sir! I shout back. With me, he replies, turning and walking the length of the runway towards a collection of squat, low grey buildings. I hurry along after them, casting a quick look at our surroundings. There is nothing but grey and white, bleak, snowy mounds of rock, mountain, mist and concrete. We hit into one of the nearest buildings, revealing it to be a part of a corridor-connected network. I trot the door closed with some effort, and with the thud of the door, the roar of the gale is replaced by the quiet buzz of electric lights. The two officers do not stop walking, and I move to keep pace. They'll want you up in the outpost before it gets dark tonight, the American says to me. And grab some breakfast at the canteen. The wind is due to die down in an hour or so. Officer Sokolov will take you via helicopter to the closest available site, and will then lead you on foot from there to the outpost. You are to address him as sir whilst you're here. Is that understood? I falter. Aye. Yes, sir. But canteen is that way. The officer points. Helicopter port is down there. I know you'll have a barrel of questions, Smith, and to not have them answered is frustrating. But you have been assigned to the outpost. You will serve for two weeks duty, possibly longer depending on the weather. You are doing a duty to your country. He stops and points again. Canteen Smith, it's that way. He claps me on the shoulder, and the discussion is done. A weighty walk, leaving me fumbling for words like an idiot in the corridor off. Of where exactly? 
I look around. Great walls, noteboards and signs. All written in Russian, of course. But I recognize a military installation when I see one. My stomach growls. I cannot deny my hunger. So I anxiously consider my predicament as I go grab some food. I think I might be the only American in this section of the facility. The canteen is mostly empty. Though there are a smattering of Russians at the far tables. Some shoot me glances. Most pay me no mind. So I mind my business in turn. Filling my stomach until it is time for the next rough deck of my journey. Since the beginning, since it first became aware back at Bardafoss that I was going on something of an excursion, there's been this building, growing, nodding knot of anxiety inside of me, slowly spinning and tightening all the cords that it is attached to. Around it goes, around and around. And the pressure rises. Another helicopter ride. The American officer bids me a rapid goodbye, and accompanied by the Russian Sokolov, I believe his name was, we are flown across the Urals, higher and higher. Sokolov gives me two pills to take en route. Acetazolamide, he mutters. Then, potassium, he points up to the sky. For our altitude, I take them both, and then... After brief consideration, he hands me a small capsule box stuffed full of them. In case of need, he says, and I thank him. The eyes now broken, I risk a question. I still don't understand, sir. This outpost, hidden away in the mountains. Why are there Americans here too? Why not just Russians? What makes this place in particular so important? International agreement is the only response. Secret. Important. And then he leans back against the helicopter walls with his arms folded, eyes closed. I sigh quietly, assuming that this means he has deemed the matter closed. But as I turn to look out the window and the world below, he mutters one more quick phrase. Monsters. At the gate. He says, as the plates of the helicopter were, round. In around and around. The helicopter goes as high as it can into the mountains. There are some decidedly nerve-inducing moments. But it at last brings us down onto a crude helipad in the cradle of a stone. Upon our departure, we are then forced to walk, to climb, almost for the bulk of the afternoon. Then evening. My head hurts. And after a point, I find myself wincing with almost every step. Not much further, Sokolov says, as a sudden sharp gust blows nose into our faces. Hour to go, ninety minutes most. Sweat butts across my forehead. But I not, and continue to climb. Seventy minutes later, the outpost itself at last shimmers into view through the fog. The mountain goes higher still. But from here, we are given a commanding view of the rocky plains and outcrops, drops and cliffs all around. At least, we would be if the day was clear. At present, these jots of rock appear as little more than looming shadows through the mists. Flashes of color drop my eye, and I glance up, wearied, to see five flags above the outpost's roof, flapping in the wind. The one on the leftmost is the flag of the Russian Federation. Pants of white, blue and red. It's in pretty good condition. Though the same cannot be said for the other flags. Tattered and string worn, past their past days. Beside the Russian flag is old glory herself, the stars and stripes. To its right of this is the Union Jack. And to its right beyond is the flag of Norway. After that is an empty spire. And then there's one more flag at the far end. And this is the NATO ensign, white and navy. As I said before, these latter four flags have seen better days. These flags are almost the outpost's tallest points, beaten by a lightning rod, and what looks like a standalone tower a little further out across the mountain. 
partly shrouded in fog. If I squint, I think I can just about make out a lightning rod of the tower zone. The outpost itself is a series of closely clustered, roughly rectangular black-gray buildings. There is a white, scratched-up tank attached to the wall of one of these buildings, linked up with pipes. I cannot see all the way around the outpost from here, but it looks like it might be built right up the edge of the cliff on the other side, and likely hangs over a steep drop. There are a couple of standalone sheds, an aerial dish or two, and what looks like a wreck of what might once have been a water tower off to one side. Sokolov clicks his tongue and mutters something under his breath when he sees it. This collapsed structure is not the most interesting feature of this outpost up here in the mountains, however, nor are the curious combinations of flak waving in the wind. There are three key features that alert my sense of curiosity the most. The first is the low circular wall that borders the outpost's perimeter. It only comes up to about waist level, and the officer and I are able to climb over it easily enough. But the surface is completely covered in chalk. Once we've crossed, I watch with uncertain interest as Sokolov carefully ensures that our hand and footprints have been scrubbed away, using his fingers to re-smooth out the layer of chalk. And the second of these three features are the symbols and scrawlings drawn all across the body of the outpost itself. Most of these drawings are crosses, but amongst them I spy multiple wheels, watchful eyes, moons and suns. I see the stars of David, an eagle with widespread wings, and what appear to be a whole horde of ancient, Slavic, or maybe Celtic runes. But the aspect that gives me the most cause for alarm is the object attached to the side of the outpost, above 12 or so feet off the ground, but clearly connected to its interior. It is, to put in bluntly, an enormous gun. It has the appearance of a massive, white-gray rifle, like something a giant would wield. Though its exact make is not one I'm familiar with, I've never seen such a design in my life. A wall too low to keep people out, religious graffiti, and the world's largest gun. I do not have long to dwell on these abnormalities, as we have now approached the outer gate of the complex. Sokolov presses the side of his hand against the buzzer, an action he repeats four or five quick times. As we wait for a response, he turns to me and scratches his jaw, looking me up and down, as if properly seeing me for the first real time, assuming me as an individual. Think good thoughts, he says eventually, tapping the side of his head. It helps. I don't respond. I only nod, unsure of what to say. The gate makes a dull wearing sound, and then, after a series of clicks, it cranks and cranks open. Two disheveled looking individuals greet us, both with American flags on their uniforms. A man and a woman. The man breathes in the cool mountain air and laughs. He clasps his hand with the woman, smiling at her. She smiles back. They are the first smiles I've seen in days. He strides out into the cold and greets Sokolov with a salute. Great God, it's good to see you again, sir. The officer grunts and nods and returns the salute, nodding to the woman in turn. She drops her own salute, and her eyes go to mine, looking me over with curiosity. Her eyes squirm beneath her gaze. I look away, and the American man turns to me. Pity flashes across his face. Best of luck to you, man, he says. Don't let your guard down in there. He makes a movement, as if to place a hand on my shoulder, then decides against it. Uh, thanks, I reply awkwardly. I'll, uh, keep that in mind. And then I watch, bewildered, as he hoists his backpack up higher on his shoulder. And with Sokolov, starts to head out, back across the outpost's grounds, towards that low little wall. Back, presumably, down the side of the mountain. As they walk away, Sokolov turns to me and points. I will return, two weeks time, when duty is done. Do not die. 
he shouts, and that's all the goodbye I'm given. Away he goes, the two men fading gradually into the fog. I slowly turn back to look at the woman. She's still regarding me, head cocked at a slight angle. She's about my age, maybe a little older. After a beat, she sticks out her hand for me to shake. April, she says. Hi, yeah, nice to meet you, Adam. She nods. Come with me, Adam. Welcome to the outpost. She glances at her watch as she leads us inside, shutting the gate up tight behind her. We have about an hour till sundown. Might be enough time. Might not. She shrugs and sighs. She looks tired. Christian's in the tower right now, but the others are all around. I'll introduce you. Right. So, am I the only new person? What's the deal with this place? The deal? She gives me another look. How much did they bother telling you? You into the supernatural, Adam? I laugh, though there isn't much humor behind it. The supernatural? No, can't say I am. Hmm, is all she says. Classic. The outpost has several interlinked corridors and several defensive style turrets jutting out through the walls with sections of thick dark glass or mesh, which I hadn't noticed from the outside, which would allow one to peer out over the rock below. She shows me the various rooms, the storage facilities, the kitchens, and the comms room. One of the rooms is just stacked full of alcohol, vodka mostly. So, uh, so how many people are stationed here? I ask after a while. Russians and Americans together, what's that like? She shrugs. It is what it is. We're civil, I suppose. They keep to themselves, mostly. The Russians. There's only six of us. Six? Six people? For all this space and equipment? She nods. Only six. Elena tells me that there used to be more. But it didn't quite work out. She makes a noise. I don't know what to make of Elena. There's something not quite right about her. Elena? April nods. Yeah, she's one of the Russians. They've been here longer. The Russians, I mean. Their command makes them stay for two months at a time, whereas NATO only needs to do two weeks. I think Elena been here a little longer than that, though. <laughs> what makes you say that? April again does not respond. She leads us into a white, hexagonal room. Six walls. My mouth drops open, and I am forced to compose myself as I look around. Three of these walls are comprised of hard glass, framed and reinforced with concrete. They look out over incredibly sharp steel doors. It's difficult to tell how far down they go from my current position in the room, but it looks pretty damn far to me. Pillars of cracked rock and narrow, unstable looking mountain arches lead away into the mist. A person could probably walk across one if they were brave to jump across the gaps and go foot in front of foot. There are stairs built into the walls here, leading up to what appears to be a higher level. I glance up to catch a glimpse of the edges of further defensive turrets. The room is lined with weaponry. There are crosses nailed to the walls. I count multiple maps, one of the surrounding mountains, one of Russia, and one of the world. The final map is intersected with dozens of gently curving looping lines. There's a collection of framed pictures on the wall. Most seem to have been taken in or around this outpost. And in the room center, on an old wooden table, is a pile of what appear to be Bibles. And as I consider this, I find myself being searched by three pairs of interested eyes. Two men have looked up at me from their game of cards. One has the Russian insignia, and the other has British. The Russian man's expression does not change, but the Brit raises a hand in greeting. Hello, mate, he says. Pleasure to meet you. Hey, I reply. How's it going? Drugo American yet. The Russian mutters. His interests are already lost. Return to his hand of cards. This is Charlie. April points to me, 
pointing at a British guy. And that's Yuri. A woman near the back of the room rises to a stand. Hello, she says, her accent thick. Welcome. She does not sound particularly welcoming. Her tone is ice. I take her in. She's tall, a long blonde hair, kept mostly in a ponytail. It goes all the way down to her back. I don't know how old she is. Thirties, maybe? She is beautiful, I decide. But for a curved and brutal scar across her face, it goes down her right cheek, through both of her lips, and finishes at the edge of her chin. In her eyes, her eyes are piercing, full of icy judgment. She mutters something in Russian, and Yuri chuckles around his cigarette in response. Don't be a bitch, Alina. Charlie chides in, though there's no heart in his words. And yeah, that's Elena. April gestures to the woman in question without looking at her. Elena holds her stance, arms crossed, and staring right at me. Christian's the sixth, but as I said, he's up in the tower right now. There always needs to be at least one person in the tower. Duty five. So what is all this? I ask, unable to keep my frustrations held back any longer. I've done nothing but get bustled around from place to place all damn day. I'm tired, I'm scared, and I want to know what the hell it is that I'll be doing. What are my duties? Who's in command? There is no command here. We are the outpost. Elena replies before April can answer. Our orders are constant. Command the first door judgment. Duties. There are five. Five duties. She lists them off. Five. Keep constant presence in the tower. Four. Do not leave outer ring of the outpost after sundown. Three. Do not use weaponry beyond outer ring. Two. Do not engage verbally with the enemy. One. Defend outpost. Do not allow enemy into the outpost. I listen as she goes through them. So who's the enemy then? I ask, looking from face to face. The Chinese or what? They seem to find this amusing. My question creates a ripple of laughter around the room. The Chinese. Elena repeats. Charlie chuckles and grins white. Dol Boyup. Yuri mutters, shaking his head as he flicks through his cards. There is no point in telling you who enemy is, Elena says, the grin quickly fading from her face. You won't believe, they never believe, you will have to see for yourself. She holds up a hand and raises her forefinger. First night, you stay out of the way, observe and watch, yes? April turns to me. Probably for the best, Adam. Oh, she announces this to the group. This is Adam, by the way. No one responds. You hear me, yes? Elena asks again. Watch, observe, do not get in the way. The sun will be down soon, lads. Charlie murmurs, checking his watch and reluctantly conceding his game to Yuri. Better get to our stations. Come to my station tonight, Adam. April says as the others all climb to their feet, sorting their equipment. And here, do me a favor and take this. She draws from her pocket a cross on a silver chain, and she passes it to me. Oh, uh, I'm not really all that religious. I reply. Elena snorts as she walks past. You will be. She murmurs. I really don't know what to make of all of this. So I accept the gift of the cross and prepare my weapon, as I'm not sure what else to do. The minutes tick by, and before I know it, I find myself perched on a section of the outpost's roof, shivering with cold and blood iced. April sits next to me. I can just about make out Charlie, or perhaps Yuri, at one of the other stations a little further out into the darkness. But I cannot see Elena. 
below us and out to the sides are the vast drops of the mountain, like a gaping jaw looming up from beneath. Ice and snow and shadow. The mists have cleared somewhat, and the starlight-tipped edges of mountains glimmer warningly far, far away into the distance. As I regard this abyss, a slow, cold terror begins to creep its way into my bones. A terror that I find hard to describe. They'll be coming now, April whispers in a voice that sends goosebumps shivering up my spine. In a way, in the darkness, a deep, low voice begins to sing. As the wind blows the sounds of the song across the mountains, April lifts a cross of her own from her neck and places it briefly against her lips. You wearing yours? She asks me, and I lift it out from the front of my uniform to show her. She nods. Keep it on. We should be fine. She whispers. Though, I gotta admit, it's nerve-wracking having somebody new here. Changes the dynamic a little. The balance. She moves into position against the little wall on the edge of the roof. And with a grunt, she hoists up a mechanical contraption of some kind, connected to the outpost itself. And the thing clanks into place. It looks like a mix between a battered old spotlight and an M4. What is that music? I murmur. April, come on, what is happening? How does the song sound to you? She asks me, staring down the side of her curious weapon. Does it sound good? I consider heart pounding. I can't make out the words, but the cadence to them, the language, they sound ancient. The tones fade in and out, layered, liquid in their fluidity, from deep low rumbles to higher pitch melodies, male to female and back. Yeah, it does, I reply. It sounds good. And although it scares me, this song, I cannot deny its beauty. I try to work out the source of the music amidst the mountains. You're trying to work out where it's coming from, aren't you? April says in pause. Yeah, I just... That's how it starts. Then, you just want to get a little closer to hear it better. Next thing you know, you just have to go and find a singer for yourself. And then... Then you never come back. April clenches her jaw. Give it a few days. The song loses its appeal. Approaching! Comes a sudden, sharp voice through the darkness. Charlie... It must be. My right! And so, the night begins. With an almost impossible speed, April hauls her amalgamated weapon around with a mechanical clank, and it slams into place. She takes quick aim, and I am treated to the sight of this weapon in use for the first time. It's quite something. I am forced to shield my eyes as an intense and fire blast of immediate control light is sent rocketing out of the weapon's barrel. This is no spotlight. This is an intensity beam the likes of which I've never seen. It sparks with dangerous crackling energy as the beam is sent like a laser out and down towards the abyss, pushing aside the remaining traces of mist as if blown with a great breath. Jesus! I shout out loud as the beam is swung around to the left. I cannot help but remember the enormous rifle attached to the outpost's roof, the one I saw when it first arrived, and I wonder if its effect is the same, and if so, what the purpose for such a monster of a weapon could possibly be. April pulls down a lever attached to the contraption side, and she launches the beam again, 
and little crackers of electricity jump between its gears as another sphere of light bursts from its barrel and screams down into the darkness. I blink as quickly and as rapidly as I can, doing my best to dispel the streaks of color that now dance across my field of vision. Through this kaleidoscope of confusion, I see to my horror a shift in the shadows far beneath. Like a living wind, it snakes and slithers from stone to stone as it approaches. The down below! I shout in alarm. April! And in response, the weapon is swung around and angled down. And again, the light ascent tearing into the abyss below with a high-pitched electric scream. The rippling wind is obliterated into shards and little dark shapes, too far down for me to see what they are, but they rattle on their way down back down the mountainside as they fall. And like lightning, the lights burn and flash all around me now. My hair is whipped away from my head in the wind, and it feels as if I am in the eye of some terrible twisted storm. The beams from Charlie's position are clear and I see lights fire out from the tower way over to my left. Further brilliant flashes in the night jump up and illuminate the edge of the mountain all around, and I can only presume that these are Elena's, or Yuri's. A new voice rises up through the sound of the song. It comes from nearby. It whispers a sinister, serpentine voice in the shadows. Fuck, she mutters, pulling temporarily back from the weapon. Adam, there should be a pile of Bibles behind you, beside the crate. You see him? Bibles? I turn, frantic, scrambling around the nearby crate in the darkness. Yes, I got one. Open it up and read one of the highlighted passages. You want me to what? Which one? Anyone, but be quick, please. Abraham. Comes that voice again. I start in terror as it sounds like it comes from right behind us, but turning to look reveals that there is nothing there. I see what lurks in your heart. You will take this new one with you. Deliver him unto me. us. When the voice is us, it is as if two voices are speaking at once. One saying us, and one saying me. It makes both sounds together. I feel something caressing the side of my face. I turn. Again, in a panic. But as with before, there is nothing there. The wind blows, and the night flashes. Come on, Adam, April says, a little more urgently as she fires off another beam. This one, however, seems thinner than the last, not quite as bright, a little less full of life in its energy. Right. Thumbing through the book with trembling hands, I catch sight of a highlighted passage, and I read it aloud. The, uh, the thief comes only to steal and destroy. I manage. My voice weak in the wind as the battle rages. Shadows drift and dance in the dark. A collective sense of clamoring, of scuttling, and of writhing is shivering its steady way up the mountainside. Yeah, no, try another! April shouts at me as she swings around the weapon, ducking instinctively to avoid a shadowed hand reaching out towards me. But when I look for it, as with before, there is simply nothing there. I find another passage. When you, when you go to war in your land against the ad adversary who attacks you, then you shall sound an alarm with trumpets that you may be remembered. Come on, Adam, with heart! April shouts as a circle of wind rises up between the mountains, swirling and crackling with terrible storm-like energy in the night. What the fuck is happening? But... I get the message. As I said before, I'm not a particularly religious guy. I don't know if I believe in God or any of that, and I don't know why I'm living through a battered old Bible on the side of a Russian mountain in the middle of the night. But we do our duty. 
so I rolled back my shoulders and took a deep breath. I hear that whispering begin again, but I don't allow myself to listen. I project and bellow out loud into the storm, the beams flashing like lightning as the mountains come to life with shadow and fire. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, my voice carries loud and clear through the frost-tipped air. April cannot help but shoot me a quick glance with eyebrows raised before returning to the weapon. She brings it quickly around with a clink, and an arc of light is sent rippling through the night. Then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, that you may be remembered. At the word trumpets, where before I conjured up in my mind something meek and modest, like a school marching band, one that I might well have taken part in as a child. I see now an army of golden horns aimed up to the heavens amid swirling dust and blasted loud and charged in their energy. The light of the beams glitters bright in the edges of my silver cross, flailing and waving in the wind. In a terrible, clambering shadow is resolutely obliterated into clattering, rattling fragments and lost to the rock of the mountainside below. And so it goes, for the longest night of my life. The hours crawl by, and the shadows come, and the lights flash, and it is not until the first thin slither of light appears welcomingly on the far horizon do we crash back against the crates and the walls up here on the outpost roof. April and I. She looks over to me, eyes bloodshot and hair streaked with sweat, sweat that will quickly freeze across her face if not wiped away. Well, there you go, Adam, she says. Welcome aboard. I don't respond. Wearily, with grunts and grimaces, she clambers to her feet to the sound of clicking bones. She stretches her arms and turns to the left and the right, cooling down the muscles. She raises a hand to someone, though I do not have the energy to turn around and see who she's waving to. Charlie, probably. Come on, she says, lowering her hand and offering it to me. I take it and allow her to help me up, and we head through the doors and back down the stairs. She shows me through a corridor towards the sleeping quarters, and we pass by Yuri coming the opposite way. One of his hands shake, and the motion draws my eye. His knuckles and fingers are all scratched, scuffed and scapped. He stares right through us as he walks by. For a moment, I think that April isn't going to say anything. Then, at the last second she says, Good job, Yuri. Yuri grunts in reply, not showing nor stopping or even turning our way. I have a thousand questions, but they can wait for now. Despite the rising of the sun, I am fit to crash. And so once April has shown me to my room, and she has shut the door behind her, I haul off my uniform and collapse into bed. A modest little thing, but right now feels like the most comfortable place in the world. I fall into immediate sleep. My questions are intertwined with my dreams, and they are realistic and unsettling. My sleep is deep and long. I wake much later in the day, unsure of where I am. I try to push away the nightmares of demons in the dark, only to realize that they were not nightmares at all. The wind blows beyond the windows. I groggily roll over and check the time. 15.45. I've slept about 10 hours or so straight. Impressive. I guess I really needed it. I rub my face and groan. So, this is actually real. This is all happening. Uh, I 
clamber out of bed and head to the sink, preparing for the new day, if you can call it a day. A handful of daylight hours left to go and then, and then what? That same hell all over again? What is this place? I arrive shortly in that white hexagonal room, the room I have taken to be the main one. Yuri has hit it right towards me, jaws at and cigarette between his lips. Hey, I say to him, good work with the, uh, with the attack last night. He does not slow his pace as he strides past, but he squints and shoots me a sneer. Fuck off. He mutters in Russian as he shoulders past me. Alright then, I say to no one in particular as he hits down one of the adjacent corridors. The others are in here. April, reading a book. Charlie, tidying up a box of cards. And Elena, stood watching the sky and the mountains through one of the windows. No one is jumping up to explain this place to me. So I say straight up, loudly and clearly. This place is fucked. Charlie and April glance up to me. Elena does not turn around. I feel like I've been pretty accommodating, I reply. But come on, for real, I would really genuinely love just a brief explanation or, or, or something. I mean, the Bibles, the shadows, light guns or whatever. Help me out here, people. What's going on? Tell me straight. It's just a prank, mate. Charlie replies after a beat, and I stare at him. He laughs. Elena at last breaks from her position at the window and walks down the edge of the room. Adam, come see here. Tentatively, I head over. She regards me with those icy eyes, then points to the world map. The one intersected with a series of gently wavering looping lines. One of the lines arcs up to the United States, and she points to it. Where were you born, Adam? Somewhere along this line, yes? I look at the map. Well, yeah, actually, just here. How did we were all born on one of these lines? She points to a place in Russia. Not many born here. Harder for our government to find the Russians. The Americans invited as part of international agreement. There are ley lines. April chimes in, looking up and over her book. You heard of them, Adam? People born on the ley lines have greater resistance to the supernatural. Greater resistance to the supernatural, I repeat. But, but the supernatural isn't real, right? As I said, fella, just a big prank. Charlie says to himself, and he leans back into his chair. But, but we're defending the opus from, from what? Demons? I laugh nervously, but no one else joins in. Demons? Really? So, so does that confirm the existence of hell? And what? Heaven? Is God real? Is it all real? The gravity of our situation begins properly setting in for the first time. Despite everything, my breathing shallows as the panic starts to rise. April rises from her seat and comes over to me, placing a hand on mine. Hey, Adam, it's okay. Elena shakes her head with frustration. She grimaces and the grisly scar that crosses through the side of her lips is pulled tight. See? This is the problem with NATO soldiers who only do two weeks shift. We have to explain this over and over. Charlie calls out. I've been here for a month, Elena. Don't you forget. Yes, but you're not typical, Charlie. Elena replies in her thick accent. You're crazy, man. I gather myself. I'm a soldier, goddammit. Pull yourself together, Adam. So the Russians stay for two months. Why is that? April replies before Elena has a chance to respond. Because the Russian command don't value the life of their soldiers, of course. 
suddenly in the fumes and makes a noise of frustration. She closes her fist and marches towards us. She only takes about two steps, but it's hell intimidating. The woman is taller than myself. A Russian stay for two months, she says, pointing a finger. Because our command have faith in us to do job well. Because we are reliable. In Russians chosen, Americans are names picked from a hat. Hey guys, comes a new voice from behind. The accent is one I recognize immediately from my time in Bardafoss, as Norwegian. I turn to look at the voice's source. A man about Elena's age comes walking into the room. He is bundled up in fur coats, the outermost of which bears the Norwegian flag. Curls of red hair broke out from beneath his winter hat, and he approaches me at once, smiling. Hello, friend, he says, taking my hand. My name is Christian. Pleasure to meet you. He jerks a thumb back in the direction he just came from. I've just come from the tower. Yuri says you did well last night. I'm surprised by this. Did he? There's a pause. Christian scratches his beard. Well, no, but he didn't say anything bad about you. So you must have done pretty okay. Right. Christian walks to the nearest of the walls and straightens one of the picture frames, taking a moment to admire the photograph within. What happened to this tradition? He says after a moment. Elena, what do you think? Maybe we should get ourselves a group pick? Elena snorts and folds her arms. No, is the quick response. Christian murmurs and scratches his beard, as if in deep thought, turning back to the photograph. So, I continue. Yeah, it's nice to meet you, Christian. I'm kind of still getting brought up to the speed here. This outpost, what's its purpose? Like, why do the demons want it so much? Why is it so important to defend? I think about my own question. And they are. Demons, aren't they? The shadows at night, or are they? And the tone shifts, and Christian turns to me, his eyes sparkling. You may call them whatever you like, my friend, he says. But they are the enemy. And why they seek this spot exactly, we do not know. We can make guesses though. He walks across the room to the maps, pointing first at the map of Russia, then at the map of the ley lines. You see where we are? He asks, pointing. I nod. The outpost intersects three ley lines, he says. It's an important place this. The outpost was built upon it. We have it for one primary reason, so that the enemy may not. There are other such places, I think. He points to a couple of other places across the map where multiple ley lines meet. Wait, you mean there are more outposts? I ask, bewildered. More places like this? I should think so, yes. Christian replies. There is one in Australia, this I know. Perhaps one in India. He points to three intersecting lines. Maybe others. I put my hands to my head. This is insane. This doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense. Elena says. And then she sighs. American yet. She mutters. Flicking her eyes away from me to April. Before turning away. Hey now. Christian says good-naturedly. We are all friends here. Comrades in coalition are the spirit of this outpost. He pats me on the shoulder. You are very welcome here, my friend. Come, I will teach you how to use the weaponry this afternoon. How the hell is this guy so cheerful? Is all I can think. As he leads me from the room and out into the cool afternoon air, up to one of the garrison posts, stationed around the outpost's roof. This one, like April's, look out over an expanse of mist and rock, 
in a steep, deep drop down the mountainside. Christian begins with a pleasant smile. The corners of his eyes crinkle as he does so. The weapon works as follows. Crank here, turn to move, aim with sights. You saw how it works, yes? I know it. Yes, he continues. They are modeled after the M4, so you should be okay. The light is powerful, but not all powerful. Do not hold its concentration for too long, or the demons adjust to the light. So that's what they are then. They are demons. I shake my head. I just don't understand. The implications of all this. Bears not to think too much about it. Christian chuckles. Think good thoughts first. It really does help. He taps the side of his head. Before my time, this next little story. But according to Elena, there was a sick guy stationed here once. He looks out over the edge. The cross did not work for him, nor the Bibles. He had a, uh, a rough first few days. How rough exactly? I risk asking. Christian sighs. I do not know. According to Elena, he lost his sight. And then the next night, whilst awaiting rescue, he simply disappeared. He lost his sight? Went blind, you mean? Then, then vanished? Yes, sadly. I dwell on this as the gust of breeze sends a shiver down my back. I follow Christian's gaze. The view really is beautiful on a clear day like this. Beautiful and terrifying in its isolation. But whilst he was here, Elena tells me that the demons were different. The things they said, the things they tried, they were unusual. How so? Christian shakes his head. I cannot say. I do not know. You would have to bring the topic up with her. How long has Elena been here exactly? I ponder. I know that April doesn't really trust her. That much is plain. She has her suspicions about the woman. And as I said, the Bibles didn't work for him either. Christian says, They are supposed to work relatively well for the Abrahamic religions, at least. We shoot the shit for another hour. The first hour to actually go by quickly since I set off from Bardafoss. He tells me about the others and about himself. He asks questions about me and where I'm from. He really is a nice guy. He tells me that Elena is friendly once you get to know her. Which I find hard to believe. That April was worse than me on the first day here. And that Yuri believes that there is only one demon. And what we see are puppets or appendages of a greater whole. We talk a little longer. And we eat together as a group. A large evening meal. Though... Our day is really only just getting started. I am to be manning a turret on the outpost tonight. The very idea sends that ball of anxiety in my stomach back into its rapid cycle of tightening. Tensing. It's a painful physical ache that comes in quick, awful cold washes. Washes that become more frequent as the hours pass and the sun creeps lower. But one cannot stop the ticking of the clock. The shadows draw in. The wind rises. And I find myself at my station, squinting out into the wind. You remember the duties? Christian had asked me. Yes, I had replied. And I listed them off. Five, keep a constant presence in the tower. Four, do not leave the outer ring of the outpost after sundown. Three, do not use weaponry beyond the outer ring. 2. Do not engage verbally with the enemy. 1. Defend the outpost. Do not allow the enemy into the outpost. Christian had nodded. Duty 1 is key, Adam. We defend the outpost. We do not allow the enemy into the outpost. 
I say it to myself now, at the edge of the mountain, in the midst of the wilderness. The wastes, the vastness and the ice and the cold. There are still so many mysteries left to solve. What's at the heart of the outpost? Why do the enemy want it so badly? Is it really all just about supposed ley lines? And why would so few soldiers be stationed in so large an outpost as this? I wonder if there are still things I'm not being told, and if I can truly trust my teammates. But these questions will have to wait. Do not allow the enemy into the outpost. I murmur out loud, my fingers trembling against the sides of the weapon. Here's the sun sinks down, below the horizon. Night falls, and the wind blows, and the first melodic notes of that sinister song are carried across the mountains towards me, and a wave of cold fear shivers through my veins. I have a couple of Bible passages memorized. It still all seems so bizarre to me, but I mean hey, if it works, it works. I mutter to myself over and over as I watch for any signs of an approaching an approaching what exactly? What am I fighting here? Demons, I suppose. Or demon, if Yuri's theory is correct. But are they? Are they really demons in the way that I am to assume they are? The same singing from the previous night ebbs and flows with the tides of the wind. A deep, low line of voice that rumbles the bone interspersed with harmonious, beautiful chords. It's different tonight though. It's ever so slightly sharper. It sounds just a little less like a song that I'm simply hearing, as opposed to a song that is being sung to me. But for the first two hours of the night, nothing further happens. A modest tumble of stone across the gorge sends my heart rate into temporary overdrive. But nothing approaches. Not yet. The tension builds. Almost unbearably. It isn't until well into the third hour that I hear Elena's voice carry across the wind. Sight it! She shouts. And across the outpost, a blast of dazzling light tears suddenly into the sky. Here we go. I wins, knuckles wide on the weapon. A part of me is almost relieved to have that brutal, building tension finally crack. It's a far clearer night tonight, and I can see further down the cliffside into the abyss. A ripple of dark wind crashes like water into the mountain down below, and this wind carries with it a shadow clambering with speed and determination up the rock towards the outpost walls. Fuck! I shout out loud as I angle the weapon down with a clank, hauling up the lever to the side and taking quick aim. Despite the cold, I am sweating, and the forearms of my jacket are currently rolled up to the elbows. The hairs on my forearms all react to the crackle and sudden electricity as I fire, and the spotlight gun sends a blast of concentrated, sunlight-style energy down towards the approaching assailant. I miss, and the creature draws closer. I catch glimpses of disturbingly human-like arms and hands bursting from the sides of the demon's form as it tears up the mountainside. I bring the weapon round with another mechanical clank, and the beam passes right through it, bursting the creature into shadowy flakes and smoke. Pieces clatter from the obliterated demon and rattle back down the rock. And the night is clear enough and the monster close enough for me to actually see the cause of the rattling this time. They are bones. As the demon is destroyed, burnt bones are sent clattering out from its ruin. Ribs and pieces of spine and, and others too. They vanish back down into the shadow pretty promptly. But they were bones alright, 
I'm sure of it. And so it goes. I do my best to keep the demons in the dark at bay. This is my task. This is my duty. And these are my orders. I cannot help but recall particular words of Christians as I bless these monsters to kingdom come. There was a Sikh stationed here once. He lost his sight. And then the next night, he simply disappeared. Disappeared. How? And why? What happened to him exactly here on the mountainside? One of the enemy below screams with the wind as the light tears it into a thousand pieces. And as the night progresses, as we enter into those hours, the furthest from the light of dusk and dawn, I watch as something clamors steadily up the mountainside opposite, not the trap directly below me. I mutter a phrase from Corinthians and aim the weapon up high with a series of mechanical clicks and clanks. Electricity judders to my veins as the light is sent soaring out towards it. But this demon acts differently to the others. It is difficult, almost impossible to focus on these creatures, such as the fluidity of their forms. But this one is more difficult still. It spreads out white into the shape of a circle, and the beam passes harmlessly through its center. I direct the weapon this way and that, but each time the entity on the opposite mountain distorts and shimmers through various dreamlike shapes to avoid it. And by doing so, my faith in the weapon's ability falters. Sweat leaks in little rivulets down my back. And a voice I recognize whispers into my ear. The voice is my brother's, made all the more alarming by the fact that my brother has been dead for ten long years. I miss you, Adam, he says. It's not him. It's dim. My heart pounds in pain and longing, fear and anger. I'd give anything to call back to him, to talk to him one last time. But I cannot, of course. I cannot. Two, do not engage verbally or physically with the enemy. I shout out the passage from the previous night, the one with the trumpets, a passage of defiance. Adam, lay down your weapon and come to the edge. The dwellers in the outpost are lying to you. You seek the truth, and, and I can provide it. As with before, when my brother's voice says I, it comes in two words, sounding as if he is saying we with the exact same breath. I grit my teeth, eyes white and knuckles cracked as I muttered the passage again and again. Over and over, my breath clouding in the blasts of the beam. My brother's voice whispers further. I know you are scared. And I am sorry for the fears I have caused you. But ask yourself where the true enemy lies. I seek nothing but safety, sanctuary and peace. But I do not listen. I push aside these intrusive words and battle on through the night, keeping at bay every creeping threat to the outpost. The beam from another turret comes to my aid. I do not know whose it is. Christians, perhaps? But it strikes through the shadowy, shape-shifting entity directly across the Great Gorge. And together with the ray of my own light, the demon is obliterated into the night with a shower of smoke and dark clattering booms. So the demons can see inside our heads then. They can access our memories. The prospect is a terrifying one. I am now decidedly unnerved and panicked. Hearing my brother's voice again coming from something other than a recording on an electronic device, it has set me on a new and precarious edge. I thought I had a basic grasp of these creatures, but I am realizing all over again that I don't have a clue what they're capable of. Anything could happen now. Lights flash in the darkness. 
I hear a voice carried across the roof of the outpost by a sudden gust of wind. Female. Russian. Lena, no doubt. And I feel a step of bitter frustration as I swing the mechanical weapon around with a clink. She's been here for a long time. That much is clear. How long exactly, I'm not sure. But it could be anything up to two months. Potentially longer. Charlie's been here for four weeks. That's what he said. And he's NATO. So, surely he should be doing too. And April seems to be under the impression that Elaine has some secrets to hide. I shake my head and mutter a curse under my breath. The system here seems to be in all sorts of shambles. Perhaps our respective commands don't really give a damn, all things considered, provided the outpost fulfills its most basic quota of six warm bodies to defend it. But I digress. Elaine has been here for a long time. Yuri likely as well. Why didn't they warn me about all this? They've barely helped at all. What have they done for me exactly? A soldier putting his life on the line in the face of such unearthly terror. I've been giving a brief lecture on fucking ley lines from Elena and scarcely a handful of words from Yuri. Maybe they're just blinded by all the anti-American propaganda they've been spoon-fed day after day. But surely up here on this mountain, they try to put that to one side, right? Surely, in the face of such greater evil. My forearms ache as I tense them and swing the weapon down with another metallic creaking clank, electricity sparking as I fire beam into the darkness below. Destroy all those who curse my soul. I recite with jaw clenched. In service I am yours. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war. Mechanical booms of thunder are sent rippling through the valley and the mountains, as the lightning-like flashes alight the rocky edges in the darkness. The Lord, of course, was not quite the one who trained my hands for war, however. I have the army of the United States of America to thank for that. A not-so-benevolent Lord, if ever there was one. Less Jehovah, more Mars. But I try not to think about this. Such thoughts I have found. Weaken the effect of the weapon. I try to follow the advice given to me by Christian. Think good thoughts. It helps. The same advice given to me by the Russian officer who dropped me off on my first night. The first night was two days ago, Adam. You've scarcely been here for two days. Feels like a fucking lifetime. But the night goes on. And the battle rages. And, as before, as always, the darkness recedes. The first glorious shimmer of sunlight rises above the jagged horizon, and the edges of the mountain are washed in faded gold. I collapse away from the weapon, my back up against the little metal railing behind me. I look down at my hands. They are covered in grime, shaking, and several of the fingers are locked into their positions. To move them causes me pain, and it wins as I try to work the blood flow back into them. And after a concerted burst of effort, I clamber to my feet and head across the roof of this section of the outpost, making my way down the metal ladder and returning into the building. In a dreary days, I pass by both Charlie and Christian on my way to my dorm. I nod at both of them. Charlie nods back. Christian even gives me a smile and a clap on the shoulder. I do as before. I shed my uniform and my coat, and I collapse into my bed. I do not even bother to draw the curtains, though it doesn't particularly matter. The daylight streaming weakly through the window is not sufficient to wake me from my slumber. And my sleep is deep. Deep. And as with the previous night. Unsettling. I awaken with a groan at 14 hours. 2 p.m. Earlier than yesterday. There's no blissful ignorance as a return to the land of the living this morning. 
the afternoon, I suppose. And I'm instead instantly aware of where I am and what my purpose is here. And what I'll need to do again tonight. I groan a little louder, rubbing my hands across my eyes, smelling the grease and grime across them as I do so. I need to start washing a little better before bed. This can't be healthy. I clean up and dress for the day, leaving my dorm and heading through the kitchen canteen to grab some breakfast. A generator hums quietly in one corner as I cook some eggs and beans and bring them through to the main room, to the hexagon. Elena is in here, eating something out of a bowl at the side of the room. She glances up from her crossword at my approach, but does not make any kind of greeting. April is in here also, at the room's opposite side. She's fiddling with a small radio, and the pieces of which lay scattered across one of the tables. Hey Adam, she says to me. Good sleep? No, no, I reply. Not really, but it served its purpose. That's the spirit, she replies as she tinkers. Say, you aren't an engineer, are you? No, sorry. No worries, though it was worth asking. Yuri is, but you know, he's a miserable bastard. Helena looks up again and swallows her mouth full of food. She chaps the hand with the spoon in it over to where April is sitting. Yuri will fix your radio. Get off your high horse and ask him. He will do this. April snorts and shakes her head. No, he won't. He'll swear at me in Russian and leave me to suffer. He isn't a good person. Helena seems to take offense to this. Yuri does what is best for good of the outpost. You need him to fix radio? He will fix radio. This is a Russian good person. American good person means fake smiles and hollow laughter all day, 24 hours. How very cliche. I mutter. A Russian with an anti-Americanism complex. Elena's cold, pale eyes flicker over to mine. And I get the uneasy sense that a great weight was just dropped on top of me. She puts down her bowl and gets to her feet. A slow motion. One that serves to draw out attention. But this woman doesn't scare me. Not after the horrors of the night. You're not typical recruit we get sent here, Adam. She says. I know that this could be the first time she addressed me by my actual name. No? I ask. No. She replies. You are timid. You have angsty aura, unsettled, childlike. You are putting the outpost coalition in danger with your presence. I stare at her, irritated, but doing my best not to seem faced. I force out some laughter and fold my arms. You've got me all wrong. How am I putting the outpost in danger exactly? I just helped successfully defend it. You know how many demons I destroyed last night? Elena doesn't respond. She only watches, searching me with those arctic eyes. I shift uncomfortably. April chimes in. Oh, leave him alone, Elena, you bully. He's doing his best. This seems to make her particularly angry. The bully comment. A flash of genuine fury crosses her face, and I watch her body twitch, her fists clench. Just for a moment. My throat dries, and I get a quick, modest burst of adrenaline. But nothing happens. Elena closes her eyes and takes a breath. And then she simply strides from the room, down one of the corridors, and towards another section of the outpost. I intense my muscles, and bring myself down into a seat near April with a grunt, to actually go ahead and eat my breakfast. We sit there for a while in comfortable silence. Me eating and April working away at a radio. She presses a button and it cracks and fizzles. She sighs. These things are temperamental at best, she says, shaking it in her hand. 
They don't work like they're supposed to up here. In this environment. And mine's died completely. I look at her. April, tell me. How long have you been here exactly? At the outpost? Just over a week. She replies. Just over a week. And Charlie's been here for four? Is that right? She nods. But I thought NATO personnel were only required to do two. Y yeah. She says uneasily. But you know how it is. They tell you one thing and then they change it. And to be fair, I think Charlie actually volunteered to stay longer. I think he wants to do two months. Like the Russians. What? Why would he want that? April shrugs again. I think he just likes the thrill. The thrill. I shake my head. And what about Christian then? So Christian's been here before. He's only on his second week right now. But he keeps coming back. I think he's been more or less alternating groups of weeks for about a year. A year? Yeah, maybe more even. Why would he do that? Why would he keep coming back? Is this of his own choosing? Or are his superiors forcing him back all the time? Our superiors, I guess. So what about Elena? He sure ask a lot of questions, Adam. Well, maybe that's because nobody tells me anything. Okay, okay. Jeez. I don't know how long Elena's been here. She won't tell me. Don't really know anything about her. But she hates me. That much is pretty obvious. The thing is though, Adam, I think she's been here for a long, long time. Like, really long. You can tell in the way she speaks to Christian that the two go way back. But I think she's been here longer than he has. And I'm not convinced that she's taking any time off either. There's something that scares me about that one. And I'm not just talking about that nasty scar. So Christian won't tell you anything either? Why not? I don't know. I think that he and the Russians are keeping secrets from us. From the Americans. I don't get it. Why would they do that? And Christian is a nice guy. He's a NATO soldier for God's sake. April just puts out her hands. Listen, come take a look at this, alright? She stands up and checks down the corridor that Elena left through before beckoning me over to the section of the wall with the little framed photographs across them. You want to see something really weird? I don't know what could possibly be weirder than what I've already seen, but sure, go for it. She leads me through a door in the wall to the small back room. It's basically a storage unit with lots of shelves, and it's full of dusty photographs, many of which have been framed. Some are kept in stacked piles, others hang on the limited wall space. She points to one such photo. Take a look at this one. You recognize anybody? I squint at it. It's a picture of a squad of six people out the front of the outpost. The enormous weapon on the outpost's roof can be seen in the background. In the foreground stand three people, with three others crouched down at the front. Five men, one woman. They're all grinning in this picture, which makes the woman initially quite hard to identify. The quality is unusual also. Quite grainy looking. But the scar, when she thinks to look for it, is obvious. It's Elena, all right. Her hair is different, and she seems a bit younger. But she still looks pretty much the same. Oh... It's a picture of Elena and the rest of the team. They're all different people. Yeah, but that's not the weird part. Check this. April again glances around, peering back out through the door before moving to unhook the picture frame from the wall. She turns it over and adjusts the clips until she is fully able to slide the photograph out from the frame. She flips it, revealing a scrawled line and pen near the bottom. Read this. She says, Look at the date. I take it from her. The handwriting is poor, but in thin black ink 
or a series of initials, and a date. SGH, 1987. I furrow my brow at her. 1987. Think about it. That would make this picture 35 years old. What the fuck are we supposed to take from that? That Elaine has been here for 35 years at least? And I mean, just look at her. You have to be 18 to join the army, right? So let's assume that in this picture she is, at the absolute lowest, 18. Does the Elena you know look like a 53 year old woman? Well, no. I reply uneasily. Obviously, Elena isn't 53 years old. Then what the fuck is she doing in a picture from 1987? I considered this, flipping it over, looking from the picture to the writing and back. No way, I murmur. This can't be right. There are loads of good explanations for this. Maybe it's not Elena. Maybe SGH just wrote 1987 on the back for a joke. There's no way this pic is from so long ago. Why would anybody do that? April asks me. Intently. Where's the joke? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's a Russian reference. Did anything of significance happen in 1987? I shake my head. It's just pen and paper, April. You can write any old numbers on photographs. It doesn't mean that they're actually from that date. April grimaces. There's something they're not telling us, Adam. The Russians. They're keeping something from us. And if it was a betting woman, I'd say it had to do with the outpost. I consider this as we return back to the main room. As April and I shoot the shit and talk about our lives back home. She's from a little further south than I. She comes from a little town just outside St. Louis. I don't think she particularly likes it there very much, based on the way she talks about it. Maybe that's why she joined the army. Eventually, she heads off to relieve Yuri from his tower duty, and I decide to wander the complex. I head from room to room, spending most of this period in an old equipment storage facility. It's full of musty, dusty old climbing gear, harnesses, carabiners and ropes, all that stuff. I recognize one such set as standard US Army issue, and it's as I'm investigating these items that Charlie's head appears suddenly from around the doorway. I jump in alarm. Afternoon, mate. He says with a grin. Then a bottle of vodka appears in his hand, and the liquid sloshes about in the glass. Fancy a quick drink? I hesitate. Uh, I don't know, man. I tell him. Is that really such a good idea? Come on, he says. Just to wet the whistle. One or two. He gives the bottle another tempting shake. I hesitate. Sure. I reply after a beat. Why not? A few hours pass. These hours comprise myself, Charlie and Christian, sharing one or two modest drinks in the hexagon. Yuri Park takes also, though he keeps to himself and sits by one of the room's windows, nursing thirstily from a bottle. He mutters to himself in Russian as he finishes it off, dropping the bottle to the floor with a glassy clink and staggering up and out of his seat, stumbling towards the low little table that Christian, Charlie and I are set around to grab another to take away. But that's just, just the thing, lads. <laughs> Listen, I'm serious. Charlie slurs as I knock over a can of questionable Russian beer with the back of my hand. Christian interrupts with his best impression of Charlie's accent. For real, lads. Oi, I'm not kidding you. It's a bloody mess, all right. Alcohol splurs from my lips as I struggle to hold back laughter, and Charlie slams a fist down onto the table with rich amusement, sending the horse of glasses and cans rattling and knocking into each other. One or two of the emptier cans fall on their sides and roll to the floor. 
If you weren't such a nice bloke, I'd knock you the fuck out, Christian. He says, just a little too loudly. Christian shakes his head and wipes some froth from his beard. Then waggles his finger in Charlie's face. No, no, you wouldn't, my friend. Such violence is not for the good vibes, yes? He corrects himself. Such violence is not good for good vibes. It disturbs. He hiccups. It disturbs the demons. Or demon. Singular. Right, Yuri? I say, leaning back and calling over to the Russian in the corner. He spits on the ground and waves a hand. The man mutters something at me. My mood sours. I throw out a hand. What's your problem, man? Why don't you like me? Give me a chance for fuck's sake. I'm doing my best here. Hey, chill out, mate. Charlie says, putting out a hand. A drunken blink rolling across his face from one night to the other. Don't be so American, you know. What the hell's that supposed to mean? I ask him as Yuri staggers to his feet. Hey, nothing personal like. Charlie says, his eyebrows shooting up as he reaches for another sip of the vodka. I just mean like, you know, needing to be liked in that. Don't stress it. He'll warm up to you in time. I'm not sure you will. I sigh. But whatever. Just trying to create some sense of co coalition. <laughs> Looking out for my fellow men. Unity, etc. Yuri snorts on his way out of the room. Pais Tata. He grunts dryly before vanishing out of sight. I reach for another bottle and take a swig. Charlie chuckles. Russians think they're hot shit because they've been here so long. Well, we'll see. I'm gonna break Yuri's record. I promise you now, lads. What about Elena's? I ask him. The man shakes his head vigorously. No chance, pal. She's been here for fucking years. So it's true. Years. Charlie shrugs and leans back in his chair, burping. I don't know, mate. I could be exaggerating. Christian knows her better than I do. I turn to him. Christian, what do you think? What's Elena's story? Christian scratches his beard. Eh, she has been here for a long time, yes. Since 1987? I whisper, anxiously. 1987? What? I stare at him. He stares back. Then laughs, taking another big swig of the beer. You're joking, right? I doubt she's been here since 1987. Not possible. Really. Actually. So, how long has she been here then? Christian sighs. She prefers me not to tell you. She's a private person. Mysterious. She has lots of history. I think she finds peace up here. Away from the world. Peace? Up here? On Demon Mountain? Demon Mountain. Charlie snorts. I like that one. Sounds like a ride of bloody Disney World. And think about it. Demons. We're fighting demons up here. I shout. Throwing out my hands and knocking a bottle to the floor with a clatter. Why haven't we all acknowledged how batshit crazy that is? We have, mate. We've just been through what you're throwing. Fuck, going through already. Charlie says, pointing his bottle at me and clapping me on the shoulder. You're doing good, mate. Just keep the demons out. Don't let them into the outpost. Don't use weaponry outside the boundary, etc. A demon spoke to me in my brother's voice last night. I mutter quietly, and the guys share a quick glance. What did he say? Christian asks. He told me that it only wanted peace. That I should ask myself who the true enemy are. You didn't respond, did you, mate? Charlie asks in a sudden panic. Of course he didn't. Christian interjects, 
You think we'd be sitting here so casually right now if we did? So, so what happens if we do respond? I ask nervously in a low voice. If they do get into the outpost. I lean forwards. The other two do likewise. They look at each other as the wind blows beyond the walls of the complex. It's snowing this evening. It might be a cold one tonight. A demon got into the complex once before with you, didn't it, Chris? Charlie asks the Norwegian, and the men nods. That was a terrible night, Adam. One of the worst nights of my life. He sighs and sets his bottle back onto the table. And believe me, I've had some low-quality nights. Alina was there also. It was like, like taking away the mosquito net by the banks of a tropical river. Charlie nods somberly and takes another sip, staring off into space. Poetic, mate. I press him. And how long ago was this worst night of your life? When was this exactly? Christian rubs his fingers over his eyes. I'm not sure. Two years, maybe? Two years? So you've been here that long? I ask him. No, he replies. I come and go. I consider this. So that confirms some of what April was saying earlier. Christian comes and goes. Elena has been here for at least two years. Quite likely longer. I need more. I need more information. And Elena. I begin, whispering now, as though Charlie seems amused by this. It's alright, mate. He slurs. She ain't gonna hear you. Speak your mind. He winks at Christian. I certainly know what's on my mind, lads. He puts his hand out in front of his chest, making the international gesture for massive boobs. This sets Christian roaring with laughter, and I cannot help but join in. Charlie, Christian laughs. You are a bad man. You shouldn't speak like that of our comrade. What? Charlie says defensively, giving up his best innocent face. I'm just saying, I'd love to have a go on those fucking tits. He elbows me. Hey, wouldn't you, Adam? I laugh drunkenly and shrug. I'm not sure, man. She kind of scares me. This sets the guys laughing even harder. Though I suppose. I put on my British accent. She does have a lovely big pair of knockers. What the fuck is going on in here? Says Elena from just behind me. And the three of us shout out in alarm and stagger up to our feet in an instant. Bottles and glasses clinking and knocking and tipping, rolling noisily across the little table and clattering to the floor. She stares with fury at the enormous collection of bottles and emptied cans across the table, chairs and floors. She looks between us, her gaze sharp and terrifying. You stupid, stupid assholes! She shouts in a thick accent. What the hell have you done? The looks she gives to Charlie and I convey basically her disgust, but the glance she gives to Christian is full of disappointment. I cringe from the second end disapproval. Christian chuckles awkwardly. Look, Elena, maybe this got a little out of hand. Do you idiots know what time it is? She asks, throwing a hand out towards the window. We have one hour until sunset. One hour. Tension ripples around the room. No, Charlie mutters, squinting and blinking at his watch. He is the only one wearing one. No, we've got ages, haven't we? I made it at least three or four. He trails off. Elena does not say anything. She just puts a hand to her head. Where is Yuri? She asks quietly, with her eyes closed. Tell me he did not have access to this alcohol. No one replies. Fuck! She shouts. Well, you all need to sober up. 
Fucking quick too. She claps her hands in her faces. Move. And move we do. Stumbling and tripping. Trying to keep out the sudden panic attacking the back of our minds. Shit. It's all I can think. As I feel the alcohol sweats start to put across my body. Shit. 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 What the hell was I thinking? I ask myself as I splash cold water into my face. Am I really so irresponsible? Charlie, that man can drink like a fish. How could I have allowed myself to get so swept up? I rub my hands through my hair, rub my thumbs over my eyes. No, no use placing blame. This is just as much my fault as it is his. A nice shower follows. The water like needles across my body. A crate of some weird Russian soft drink is discovered in the back as I drive myself off. A curious green Gatorade-like juice labeled Tarkuna. I pop the cap and chuck one down. Yes to the others. Tastes okay, I guess. Though, I don't know how long it's been here. The electrolytes, if indeed it has any, should do me good. I can hear Elena arguing with Christian in another room, though I cannot make out the words. Ugh. I take a look at myself in the mirror, yet my bloodshot eyes, the guilt in my expression. I give myself a light slap across the face and head toward my station with a few parting words to Charlie. He raises his eyebrows at me and grimaces, but says nothing. Time's up. Our revitalization hour has passed. The night cometh. I clamber up to my ladder, and wince as my head breaches the gap in the ceiling. The wind blowing cold and fierce into my face. Elena shouts out at me from below. I turn down to her, pausing on the final rung. What? Yuri! He shouts again, angrily. Where is Yuri? Crap. I didn't... I don't know. I hadn't seen him since earlier. He's not at his station? No! Elena replies. He isn't. And the sun will be down in a minute or so. She draws her radio from her belt and up to her mouth. April! April! Come in, please. Have you seen Yuri? Oh, Elena. I call down. April's radio is still broken. She won't be able to hear you. Elena swears loudly in Russian, slamming the radio back into its clip on her belt. What is wrong with you people? She exclaims, swiveling on the spot and marching off through the complex. Shivering, I return to the ladder and ascend up and onto the roof, heading over to my position by the gun and dropping down to a crouch, looking through the sights at the mountainside all around. Another clear night tonight. I blink rapidly, trying to force away the dizziness. The bitter cold of the air helps. Somewhat. I am aware of the gravity of my fuck up. But still, I do actually feel a little braver tonight. Brave? No. You're just stupid idiot. Idiot. You're still drunk. The sun sinks behind the mountains. I wipe a sheen of alcohol sweats from my forehead, glancing away and up to the sky. Clouds swirl softly overhead, and little flakes of snow begin to fall, one by one. I wonder how long it'll take for the demons to show up this time. Last night gave us three hours of steadily building tension. Could it be a similar story tonight? More maybe? My question is swiftly and brutally answered, even before I have had time to allocate significant brain power to such a line of thought. They appear. To my utter dismay, the demons arrive at the very instant the night begins. The tip of the sun sinks beneath the horizon, and the sun begins to shiver its way through the night from peak to peak. In this tonight, 
jarring sharp notes where one does not expect them, like nails on a chalkboard. I grit my teeth. Dark, void-like air crashes in the form of waves into the cliff far below, right where the rocky slopes are lost to darkness. In up they clamber, to, to begin with, shadowy, near formless shapes, those long shimmering arms reaching out, grabbing hold of the rock and hauling themselves up towards me. The arms vanish back up into air as more are thrown out, an endless cycle of grabbing hands and clawing feverish limbs. How I suck some mountain cold air in through my teeth and angle down the weapon, and the great contraption clanking and creaking as I fire the first chaotic stream of screaming light. Down tears the beam with an electric shudder, an air of gold in the gloom as it burns right past the demons directly below. I curse and try again, this blast going to white. Come on, come on. Third time lucky. I feel the chattering in my forearms as the light is sent searing down and the demons are both caught together. They burst into wisps of smoke and shards of clattering bone. And I bring the weapon around, firing again as the next of the abomination appears over to my left. This is not good at all. Where the hell is Yuri? Is Alina even at her station yet? She was trying so hard to make sure that the rest of us were all ready. Why did the demons have to arrive so early tonight? Shit. One of the creatures gets frightening close. Adrenaline surges as the shadow ripples up the mountainside towards me, reaching up and out with a desperate hand. And at this range, I swear I can see the rough outline of… of something in its shadows. A head and a pair of shoulders, perhaps. A jaw that stretches from one side to the other opening white as the darkness spills out. I cry out in horror and slam down the weapon, releasing a beam directly beneath, temporarily blinded as the blast thunders out and roars down the rocky wall below, destroying the demon with a screech and a clatter of bones. One of these bones, a piece of rib by the looks of it, flies up and over my head. I duck to the side as it flies behind me and strikes the wall tumbling down to the ground below. Too close. Come on, Adam. Come on. Don't let the enemy into the outpost. I blink some more as the colorful streaks of red and a blurred light flash across my vision. I groan and my stomach lurches. I've found a way to somehow make my experience on this outpost even worse. Your comrades' lives are at stake. Wake up, soldier. Wake up, Adam whispers the voice of a demon into my ear. I chop in fright and swat at the air instinctively. But there is always nothing there. Wake up and see the truth. We I require entry to the tomb. We I do not want to hurt you. But we I will do what I we must. We I I have been waiting for a long, long time. I grit my teeth and swing the weapon around, firing off concentrated bursts at the approaching targets. What the hell are those things? I mutter to myself, blasting the weapon again and again. The alcohol has provided me with some temporary resistance to the cold, it would seem. The wind, despite the shock of the initial chill, does not seem quite so brutal. But the trade-off in terms of accuracy and sense of impending doom were really not worth it. Not worth it in the slightest. Many of my shots go wide. The demons clamber ever so closer to my position, streaming constantly up the walls. And every time that they reach a certain distance away, my terror flares up. The fear of the unknown. I still don't know exactly what would happen if such a creature were to breach and make their way onto or into the outpost. A shot way off to my right draws my attention. I shoot a quick glance over the roof and catch a blur of movement at the wall's edge. Lightning-like flashes in the darkness all around illuminate the edge of the cliffs, the walls, and my comrade, Yuri. My blood freezes. The man is a mess. Stationed on a section of a roof across the gap, over to my right, 
He is shouting belligerently down and into the shadows below. I watch in horror as a pair of hands grab the wall by Yuri's side. It's difficult to see from this distance. But there is nothing else they could be. Yuri bellows in Russian and staggers back to his weapon, grabbing it, taking careless aim and then swinging the thing around in a chaotic arc, a blast of light tearing towards me. Right past me in fact, as I shield my face from the rush of heat, slipping and stumbling backwards and striking the section of wall behind me with a thud. Jesus! I shout. Yuri, what the hell? But he cannot hear me. Either that, or he is simply failing to listen. The light goes white again and again as the man struggles with the machinery. He wipes his eyes with a sleeve and slurs a long string of words as he sways from side to side. I reach for my radio and bellow into it. Elena, are you there? Yuri is up on the post right beside me. But he's a mess. Something's going to happen. Something bad. And as I speak, I watch. I watch as a dark shape grabs a hold of Yuri's arm. Yuri swears and draws a knife from his belt, hacking and slashing at the smoke. It seems to do little, however, and more of the substance envelops him. A moment more, and he is falling. The shadows drag him over the edge. I watch, with eyes wide, and everything in the moment begins to play out in slow motion. Yuri slips from the wall and tumbles down the cliffside into the darkness below. Lights flash at the edges of my vision, and the snowflakes fall thicker all around. Yuri! I shout. But the man has vanished. I draw my radio up to my mouth and try to report this, hand shaking. He's... Yuri's gone over. I shout. He's gone over the edge. But my radio only crackles with static. I look down over the edge, peering into the darkness. Hastily, I return to my weapon, launching a beam in a white, axe-like arc directly below, obliterating a group of the demons and illuminating, for a moment, Yuri, trapped on a rocky outcrop below, his back against the cliff, darkness swirling all around him. Shit, Yuri! But the man does not respond. Unsure what to do. I spend a further few moments blasting demons away from the rock below, shooting a few white to try and keep Yuri's immediate area free from them. And in a moment of brief respite, with the cliffside below entirely clear, I make a decision. I abandon my post, aware of the critical importance of the first rule. But still, there is a man in danger. I scramble down the ladder in haste and sprint through the complex corridors towards the equipment room, the room that Charlie found me in as it happened. I burst in and look all around. Where is it? Where is it? And yes, in a rack stashed in a corner is just what I found earlier. Stand a US Army issue, covered in the dust, a set of old climbing gear. I run over and grab it into my arms, running as quickly as I can back through the halls, over to the room and ladder that will take me up to Yuri's post. And I climb, up I go, back into the wintry world above, and dumping the equipment onto the ground in the snow as I jump to Yuri's weapon, angling it around and feeling the electric crackle across my skin as I send the beam out diagonally down the side of the cliff. Demons burst and steam with shattering bones, and I swivel on the post grabbing the equipment and getting myself into it as quickly as possible, finding an anchor to attach it in, all whilst simultaneously trying to protect both my own and Yuri's section of the wall. I swear to myself, over and over, sweating and shaking in the snow, my hands alternating between the straps on the gear and the mechanisms of the weapon attached to the wall. I try to radio again, for a second time, I try simply shouting, as loud as I possibly can. Christ, I should have called to someone when I was in the complex. Why didn't I think of that? But it's too late now. Yuri! Yuri! I call down. And the man looks back up at me. His face illuminated briefly and faintly in the distant flash. A demon slithers up onto the rock by his feet, 
and he kicks Eddie in alarm. I jump to the weapon. Duck! I shout, firing a prolonged beam down into the shadows. Yuri shoots his face as the demons about his feet are obliterated and I bring the beam back across the chasm below. I jump, I jump for a bible of which there are several piled up against the wall and I flip one open, rifling through the pages for a good passage. But it's pointless. It's all in Russian. I can't read a single word of this. Oh God, I shout. Then I lean over to the edge and throw the Bible down to Yuri. He reaches up to catch it, but misses, and it lands unceremoniously at his feet on the ledge beside him. I'm coming for you, man, I mutter, finally finishing up fixing the climbing gear to myself and the outpost. And, with a breath, clambering over the side and stepping clumsily down into the dark. The sensation is hugely, hugely uncomfortable. It's like the air is thicker down here, wetter almost. It becomes harder to take in breaths. But down I go, step by step down the rock, praying that the demons will stay in the darkness beneath, just for a little longer. Long enough for me to grab Yuri and haul him back up and over the wall. I reach the man and put out a hand. He stares at me, eyes bloodshot, forearms all scratched up and bleeding. He says something to me in Russian, staring with utter disbelief. Come on! I shout to him. No man left behind, goddammit! Yuri stares in Russian and grabs a hold of my shoulder straps. We're going up. Come on, help me here. You have to climb. I tell him grabbing a hold of his jacket and making to haul us both back and up against the side of the cliff. Back up we go, blood pounding in my veins, and I can only watch in dismay as, despite my better hopes, a demon slithers its way right past us. I get the closest view of one of these creatures so far. From this angle, it looks vaguely, ever so slightly, human one compromised of rippling smoke and mist. Its arms move with such speed that it's impossible to tell how many it might have. An arm stretches up, grabs hold of the rock to drag the demon up. And in the very same second, another arm comes up to replace it. And another, and then another. No! I shout out into the night as the demon rushes right past and grabbing hold of the lip of the outpost wall above and clambering over the side and onto the roof out of sight. No. Yuri, come on! I shout to the man, and together we climb back up the rope, faster than I would have thought possible. But we reach the summit and fling ourselves back over the edge and onto the outpost. I take a deep and shaky breath, throwing myself at the weapon and bringing it around, a light releasing into the darkness. I grab the man by the front of the uniform, are you good, Yuri? I shout. Can you mend this thing? He nods, bewildered. He shoves me away and returns to his station, reaching for a Bible and flipping through the pages, and I make to unfasten myself from the climbing harness. I grab my radio again, bringing it up to my mouth. Attention! I say into it. A demon! There is a demon in the outpost! I tear the equipment off and clamber unsteadily down the ladder, darting through the complex, looking this way and that for any sign of the intruder. I don't know what I will do if I actually find it, however. Everything is a blur. I just know that this is partly my fault, my responsibility, and so I have to be the one to deal with it. Shadows lurk and creep in the corners of the complex. A light flashes through the thick glass of the windows as I race between the walls. Hey! I shout down the halls. Hey! Show yourself! A voice crackles through my radio. Elena's. Two words. Where? She says. Then. When? I grab the thing and bring it up to my face. Uh, five minutes ago or so, 
my side of the outpost, with Yuri by Yuri Station. The radio crackles. And where are you now? She replies. Inside the complex, near the kitchens, trying to find it. No, return to your station. Do not engage. I will deal with this. The ice in her voice makes it difficult to disobey. I falter. But then, just do as she says, running back through the complex, expecting to get jumped at any second, returning to my post and ascending the ladder. A part of me is waiting for a demonic hand to reach out below me, to grab me around the ankle and drag me down in a way into the darkness. But no, nothing happens. I climb back up and out into the snow, shielding my eyes as a light beam lights up the area immediately before me. One of Yuri's. Bones rattle and clatter down the mountainside, and I return to my weapon, carrying on with my duty. The fear, like a fire within me. Elena's voice comes through the radio again. letters if possible. Do not return into complex for any reason. We must wait and hope for the rising sun. And so I do. I reach for a nearby crate and heave it across the roof in order to block out the little passage back into the outpost. I draw up the ladder with a clatter and block up the entrances as best as I can. Is this really our plan? I can't help but wonder. Leave the demon inside to its own devices? What happens at daybreak? Will it simply die? That's what I'm hoping, but it's too chaotic right now to formulate any kind of serious alternative. I just do my best to keep any further demons from breaching the walls. Rule number one, do not let the enemy into the outpost. Fuck. Oh hell, and I was doing so well too. What's going to happen now? What's going to happen to the outpost? To us? I remember Christian's words from earlier, about the last time the demons got into the complex. It was like, like taking away the mosquito net by the banks of a tropical river. I grimace, and as the night deepens, the demons become more and more numerous. Whereas in the previous nights and in the past few hours, it was the occasional assailant clambering up the cliffside in ones or twos. They now appear thick and fast, in hordes, constant, an endless stream of monsters in the dark. Sweat pouts from my body, and I can feel it freezing across my skin. My hands ache and burn with exertion. The muscles in my shoulders and upper back scream in time with the blasts of the burning, blinding light. The song from the mountains is almost entirely lost beneath the endless shiver and battle of ribs and bones and spine, as demon smoke billows in all directions. My silver cross is gripped tight in my left hand. My voice repeats a nonsensical tale of ceaseless, disjointed, vaguely appropriate Bible verses until it is hoarse. And still I shout out into the darkness. The whispering becomes worse. And the things they say. Adam, you are no first man. Stand aside. You cannot stop the tide. You are a good man, Adam. You do not belong here. And this. Just let, let us pass. We I won't hurt you or your friends. We I promise. Let us in before it is too late. We I can save them if you let me. Your brother would understand. Just stand aside. Tricks. All of it. Tricks. I have to believe this, because any alternative is too dangerous to even consider. So I do my duty. The outposts and the surrounding mountains are flashed with light and fire and smoke all the long way through till the sparks of the morning. I do not collapse with instant relief as the first flicker of sunlight appears on the horizon. I do not even notice it. My eyes are shot with retina burnt streaks of color. Every blink is like a firework show. 
My hands are white and frozen. Yet, still they tremble violently, gripped tight to the sides of the weapon. I angle it this way and that, then back again, searching for demons, still repeating the verses over and over. But, after several minutes of no further approaching creatures, I finally risk a quick glance up to the sky. I see the light, the natural light, of the day, not whatever terrifying light it is that we create here with these accursed weapons. I gasp and stagger backwards, unclenching the fingers of my left wrist, slowly, listening to them crack and I carefully pry the silver across my grip. A deep imprint has been left in my flesh, the outline obvious, and I return the little cross to my chest, the eyes still white, shivering. In a dreamlike haze, I push aside the crate and the other items I used to barricade the entrance to the rooftop lookout. I send the ladder back down with a metallic rattle, the noise like the bones of the demons against the rocks. In turn, and step by shaking step, I descend, my muscles failing me on the final few rungs and I crash down into a heap at its base, groaning as I try to climb back up. Sleep. I need sleep. It's weird. My mind tells me I need to rest, but my body remains on high alert, heart pumping, senses primed despite my weariness. It's very difficult to describe, and I know I'm going to get shouted at by Elena too. Something I'm really not looking forward to. Elena. Fuck. And the demon. There's still a demon between these walls. Christian appears at the end of the corridor, rubbing his forehead. Christian. I croak out, raising a hand and walking towards him. The light from the sun has yet to do more than allow the briefest trickle of light to the glass, and the walls are still thick with shadow. Christian, hey, is it safe? Do the demons all disappear when the sun rises? Is there anything we need to do? Christian sighs as I approach. He brings up a second hand to rub his eyes. Christian, I say in a voice barely above a hoarse whisper. You heard the radio, right? The demon. The one that got in. Is it gone? What do we do? Is it safe? The man removes his hands from his eyes. A dark, human-sized silhouette at the corridor's end. A warm body between these cold, sterile walls. And he turns to me. Slowly. His body remains perfectly still, however, as to his shoulders, and only his head makes the turn, turning slightly, ever so slightly, further than it should. I stare at him, and he at I. He steps from the shadows, and I am able to see his eyes in the dim glimmer of light. The color in them has completely vanished. There is only white, with the tiniest pinprick of a pupil in the center of each. I take a slow, horrified step back. Christian. The black of the men's pupils dilate. They expand, and they expand further still, until the entirety of his eyes are washed over in black. His body cracks as he moves around to line up with his head, and step by step, he begins to make his way towards me, shambling through the shadows. For a long, grim moment, I'm stuck fast with shock as Christian shambles his way through the corridor towards me, 
Several of his shadows are cast out in impossible directions. They flicker and jolt with his movements, and he opens his mouth to speak. And the spell is broken, and I take a hasty retreating step. C Christian? Like a sudden sword in the darkness, from seemingly out of nowhere, appears Elena. She throws out a hand and stands in front of me, tall and defiant. Idiot. He mutters to me, shooting me a quick cold glance. Do not engage verbally with the enemy. The enemy? I whisper in reply as Elena raised her rifle. The silvery light of the morning catches in her hair and reflects in the dark, void-like pools of Christian's eyes. Christian's jaw falls open, and a myriad of conflicting voices pour out, slithering through the air, the sounds serpentine. Adam, don't let her hurt me. We aren't so different, you and I. They lie below. Let us return to them. Adam, don't stand in my way. A loud, sharp shot rings loud and painful down the corridor. I catch a flicker of recoil. Elena's weapon jumps up ever so slightly, and with a flash, Christian drops like a stone to the ground. What the fuck? I hear Charlie shout out above the ringing in my ears. And then he appears beside me from an off-shooting corridor, watching in alarm as Christian strikes the floor. The man lands into line with the window. The first rays of the day's light fall across his skin. Elena, he mutters, writhing on the floor, blood leaking and pulling out beneath him. I... I can't see. And a second later, the man starts to steam. The process takes literally seconds. One minute he is there, whole, and the next, his mass begins to drift away in the form of thick, dark smoke. It sticks to the walls like tar and condenses on the ceiling, and all that remains behind is a blackened, charred skeleton. Ash, blood, and a thick, viscous, semi-liquid connecting it all with unsightly strands of inhuman gristle. We stand there, in horrified silence, Charlie and I, and beside us Elena, like a statue. And the ringing echoes in my ears, and I turn to her, to this mystery that shot down the demon, and I notice that she has started trembling, ever so slightly, almost imperceptibly, but she shivers nonetheless. She swivels on the spot and marches away, shoving me to the side as she does so and I catch the briefest glimpse of tears streaming down the sides of her cheeks. She disappears around the corner, leaving the Englishman and I in the corridor, alone with Christian's remains. Charlie wretches. Then he turns away. I'm sorry, mate. He murmurs under his breath. Then he passes me by. We'll deal with this later, Adam. He says bitterly, just go to bed, get some sleep. Get some sleep, he says, as I try and fail to comprehend this horror. Christian, is that it? Is he dead? Just like that? Unless... Charlie! I shout out, turning to look the way he went. That was a copy, right? A demon clone or whatever. Tell me that thing was Christian's copy. That wasn't Christian, right? But Charlie does not reply. And I do not go after him. I look for one final time that morning at the smoldering remains in the corridor center. And then, with a grunt of frustrated anguish, I pass it by, carefully sidestepping and walk into my room. Don't think about it. Just do as Charlie said. Get some sleep, rest, recuperate, sleep at him. And somehow, I do. I crash into bed, 
and the dreams and nightmares blur sickeningly with my reality. They are disjointed and chaotic, and in my head I hear them speak to me, the demons, begging and pleading with me to allow them entry to the outpost. And amongst their voices is Christians. I awaken to the sound of shouting. I groan and turn to my side. The light from my window suddenly intends across my eyes. Christian, I mutter, still half asleep, as the shouting becomes clearer. I can't understand what's being said. It's all in Russian, Elena and Yuri by the sound of it. I sigh and draw myself up and out of bed. There's work to be done. I follow my routine, regimental, and the shouting only goes on and on as I do so. It does not falter until I enter the hexagon room. I still bleary, head still pounding. Elena is right up in Yuri's pace, though she leaves him to be and marches right up to me upon my arrival. Yuri sighs and slumps down into a seat, fumbling for a cigarette, but Elena jabs a finger into my face. Her arctic eyes bore into mine, her scar pulled grotesquely as she snarls at me. Understand the impact of your actions, she hisses. Your idiocy has cost Christian his life. He was a good man, he was an idiot like you. But he was a good man. He deserved better. So much better. Her focus flickers from my left eye to my right and back. It's deeply unnerving. I don't even know what to say. So that confirms it for sure then. Christian is dead. What? I begin quietly. What do we do now? Now we wait. Charlie has to deal with Christian's bones. I have gotten radio through to command. Urgent backup requested. But who knows when they will arrive. Two days? Three days? More? We will face very hard conditions tonight. And next night. The outpost needs six. Five is suboptimal. We will struggle to defend. And it is your fault. Her lips pull back in a dark sneer. And she turns, points to Yuri as well. Your fault also. Then she shouts out a string of obscenities in Russian. Yuri doesn't even look over. He just lights up his sick and takes a drag. Elena raises her hand and I flinch. But she only points it behind me, back down the corridor. Now we wait. Charlie has dealt with Christian bones. Go relieve April from her tower. That is where you will be stationed today. April will fill you in on what to do. Small tip, don't get drunk and fuck it up. She shakes her head. American yet. And then she simply strides away, leaving me to wallow in my guilt. I run a hand through my hair, as gently snowflakes fall beyond the glass, flittering down into the rocky gorge beyond. You good, Yuri? I asked the man. He stares out the window. He makes no noise or gesture in response. And I let out a sigh. Guess I better go take over from April then. She sure missed quite the night. I head through the complex and past the site of Christian's demise. I paused there for a moment. The floor is stained, and there are residual marks and splatters of inky like substance in the windows' frames and in the ceiling's corners but it looks like Charlie cleaned the bulk of the mess himself. I swallow. I'm sorry, man. I murmur into the dreadful silence. I'm so, so sorry. Then I turn away and continue down the corridor. The exit that would lead me to the courtyard and the tower beyond is just ahead. But as I approach the complex's rough center, a voice calls out to me. Charlie's. Hey, he says, and I stop, turning to the voice's source. Yeah? 
he peers at me from around the doorway. There is no mischievous grin this time. No foolish shaking over vodka bottle. Just exhausted bloodshot eyes. A grim face. He gestures for me to come over. And I do so. Following him into the room. He nods down to the ground by our feet. I don't know what this room is used for. Wooden flooring, a low stage. There are some chairs stacked up by the walls. Could be a meeting hall of some sort. But all that's irrelevant, as the object of interest is quite obvious. In the middle of the room is an ugly, roughly human-sized hole in the ground. The boards and planks have been torn up and ripped. The floor around it is covered in scratches, and rock and concrete have been cracked and chipped low. Some granules of the stuffs have been scattered about the floor. What the hell happened here? I ask, murmuring. Charlie gestures to the hole. Some cunt's been in here, trying to get down. He crouches and runs a hand over the splintered wood. The claw marks by the looks of them. He turns to me. The demon was in here, and he decided that this was a good place to start digging. It doesn't look like it got very far. The hole is noticeable, but it hasn't gotten that deep to be honest. Maybe about four feet or so. I sigh and rub my forehead. Charlie, just tell it to me straight, man. What else do I need to know about this place? No secrets, no hiding stuff. Just tell me. He stands up and brushes the dust from his knees. The outposts have always been staffed. Always. Russians do two months. Outsiders do less. I don't like that. I wanted to stay and beat Yuri's record. He rubs his nose. Elena? I don't know. She never talks. Yuri might know more. But I swear, she's been here for years. I don't know why. Can't imagine why someone would want to live in a shithole like this. Maybe she's been ordered to stay. Punishment for something. Maybe for whatever got her that scar, I don't know. He shrugs. He kicks some of the dust across the floor. Demons. We fight demons. I'm not convinced that's what they are, to tell the truth. But since religious stuff seems to work against them, it's a good guess as any. But not all religious stuff, right? Christian. I pause as I mention his name. Involuntarily. Christian told me about a guy who was here before us. Sick, I think. Didn't believe in any of it. He said that the demons were different. Yeah, that's right. I wasn't here for it, obviously. But I've heard of the incident. Don't know what happened to the guy in the end. He just vanished. But the demons... Christian said that when the sick was on duty, the demons often took forms of shapes. Shapes? Eye. Spheres. Cubes. Cones. Weird shit like that. He said they all shared a vision of an endless rain of coins across the mountains. That the outpost was smothered in it. Drowned in it. Drowned in metal. And then the next thing they knew. The vision passed. Who was this? Christian was there with Elena and four others. No clue who they might have been. Similar group to ourselves, I should think. I shake my head. I still don't get it. Why only six? Why six people? It's like the basis of a ritual or something. A ritual? I don't know, mate. Just a guess. I sigh. I don't think it's anything like that. I think that it's more to do with the fact that we don't want to broadcast our location. Too many warm bodies in the water. And don't want to broadcast our location? I laugh. Dryly. The outpost has a tower. Have you seen the gun on the roof of the building? Charlie shakes his head. I don't mean it like that. The demons don't care about any of that shit. It's us that interest them. The humans. With our human fears and thoughts. They think that they can use us. They can use us to get inside the outpost. The kid inside the outpost. I echo. 
and why in God's name would they want to get in here? Charlie shrugs again. <laughs> well, that's the question, ain't it? He glances to his watch. You're on tower duty tonight, right? I nod. He nods in return. You'd better get off there then, before Elena gives you a bollocking. But first, take a look at this. A little clue for a burning question. He gestures to the hole. Take a look down there. I glance down to it. There's nothing there, Charlie. It is not even that deep. He shakes his head, interrupts me. No, and get right down and press your face against the concrete. There's a tiny, tiny little keyhole sized crack in the rock beneath it. Really look. Cautiously, I do so. I cannot see the hole to which he refers to at first. In a grunt and winds as the dust blows about my face. I feel like an idiot with my head and shoulders down this hole in the middle of the floor. But at last, I see what Charlie is referring to. And is it? Yes, he replies, and he passes me a small flashlight. There's another chip in the rock to your left, a little narrower. You see that? Press the flashlight against it, then look down the hole below, and tell me what you see. I take the light from him and do as he says, closing one eye and pressing the other up close to the little crack. The glow is feeble, and it takes my vision a moment to adjust. But yes, I think, uh, I think I can actually see something, or the edges of something. Some things, I should say. What the hell are those? I murmur. Beats me, I hear Charlie say. But there's something down there alright, and I'm guessing that. And that's what the demon wanted. What they all want, perhaps. I squint a little harder. It's difficult to explain what I can see. But I'll try. Way, way down there in the darkness below me. The faint shimmer from the flashlight through the hole illuminates the very edges of a series of repeated uniform shapes. It's difficult to gauge their size, as I don't know how far down they are. But at a guess, I'd say they were no smaller than myself. The things appear to be stacked in rows. I can only see the very edges of the tops of these things. But they descend down into the murky darkness beneath. What are they, goddammit? What are they? Ugh, I can't see well enough. I draw back, coughing with a sudden inhalation of dust. Any theories? Charlie shakes his head. Not a clue. We'll ask Elena when she's cooled down a little. I grimace. <laughs> when she's cooled down? Charlie, I don't know the intricacies of their relationships all that well. But it seems to me that Elena lost a pretty close friend that night. And let's face it, it's largely our fault. Yuri's too sure, but all our faults nonetheless. If you're waiting for it to cool down, you might be waiting a long fucking time. Charlie considers my words. He clenches his teeth and stares off into space, but says nothing further. He looks away and strides off down the corridor, his head down. I think about calling after him, but there's no use really. I just stand back up and continue my little journey. April's waiting for me. Tower duty time, I suppose. I cross the courtyard as flakes of snow drift lazily down to the gravel that crunches beneath my feet. I pass by the ruins of the water tower and head for the tower still standing, the one at the very edge of the cliff looking out far across the mountains. I'm still yet to actually step foot inside it. I clamber up some concrete steps and slide my way through the tower's door. Rule 5. I hear in Christian's voice. We must keep a constant presence in the tower. I see in my mind the crinkles of his eyes as he smiles and a grimace, blurring the image away. The interior is dark and gloomy. I'd have expected nothing less. 
but my eyes are instantly drawn to the great frame painting hung on the wall opposite. It has been painted in shades of brown, of grey, of white and of gold. It depicts a woman in the midst of a windstorm. Her ropes blow up out her shoulders as she stared fiercely out at something unseen, just above the painter's point of view. She has in her hand a shining silver cross, and she stands defiant as the stone is whipped about her being. I glance down to the little plaque nailed into the varnished wood at the painting space. There is a small line of text in Cyrillic, but her name is given as Olga of the Rus, Olga of Kiev. Beside it on the wall is a small passage scrawled with chalk in French, and then another passage scrawled in English. I'm no linguist, but I would guess that they probably say the same thing. The English passage has a number of words crossed out. Olga's Tower For her sacrifice For the anchoring Anchor Tethering And the walls 899 to 969 AD Hmm I consider this With one last parting look up into Olga's eyes Her expression fixed Yet a life with passion. And I continue along my way, up the ascending stairs that line with the inner walls of the tower. And they carry me up about halfway and plaster it across these walls, or a number of things of fake interest. Crude chalk doodle, some infographics in Russian. There are schematics of the tower itself and of that enormous gun on the outpost's roof. One very realistic, very disturbing sketch of a demon clambering up the tower wall right beside me. The stairs come to a stop on the floor with a modest, crappy bathroom, one lined with leaking pipes, and besides the door to this bathroom is a steel ladder, one which presumably carried me up to the very top. With a sigh, I continue my climb, my boots rattling and echoing against the rungs. The ladder leads me up to a little platform that encircles the inner walls, and I cross over to another. Another ladder, I mean. This is the one that finally carries me up to the top. The highest room, with a vantage over all beneath it. Grunting, my head breaches the floor level of the uppermost room. And at last, I find April huddled up against the wall. She stares at me with dark, shadowed eyes and we regard each other, her against the wall, and I paused at the top of the ladder. I is it true then, Adam? She asks quietly. Is Christian dead? I glance to her right. There sits her radio. A little light on the side flickers in and out of focus. I guess she got it working, to a degree. Or someone else has been up here to visit her. A visitor? With such a climb? <laughs> Not damn likely. Yeah. I mutter, guiltily. Yeah. Christian is dead. A demon got him. April says nothing. She just brings a hand up to her eyes and allows herself some silent sobs. Her shoulders shaking as she turns away. I find myself struck with a rush of sudden, unprocessed emotion of my own, and I complete my climb, slumping down against the wall opposite and looking into my hands, slowly opening and closing my scratched, scarred fingers as the wind blows beyond the walls. How did it happen? April asks me after a while. I sigh and rub my hands across my face, inadvertently smearing myself with the grime from the ladder as I do so. I don't know really. He was possessed. I saw him. I called out to him. I think he heard me as he started walking towards me. Or the demon did, I guess. And then... I pause. Elena shot him. He fell into the light. And... And that was it. He was gone. Elena. I... I can't see. 
I swallow. I don't share his final words with April. Fucking hell. She says, shaking her head. Shit. She stands up and clenches her fists, then heads to the ladder and begins to climb her way down. Hey, I say. Wait, what am I supposed to do here? Just check the line of sights. Two of the weapons in here are the same as the others, but the large one has more of a kick, so be careful. I gotta go. Enjoy. There's ration boxes in that corner. Someone will relieve you tomorrow. Does your radio work? Do you have it on you? I... yes, I have it. Good, she says, just before her head disappears from sight below the floor. See you. And away she goes, the ladder shaking as she clambers down the rungs. I fumble for words for a second, and then just let them go with a sigh. Fine. Use the weapons. Follow the lines of sight. Seems simple enough, I guess. Fuck it. I grunt as I get to my feet, and I walk the length of the room. There are several vantage points, and the wind blows through them and into the room. It is cold, and it is miserable. The three weapons are all equidistant, and they provide lines of sight way down to the courtyard below, to the outer wall of the complex, and the snow in the mountains and the rockscape beyond. I study these weapons. Two of them are essentially exact copies of the weapons I've been using so far, stationed around the outpost's roof, but the third looks more like a modified javelin. I peer around it. The barrel splits into four at the end, and I give the weapon a shake, the mechanisms clanking as it judders from side to side. I peer through the sights and flick between two fields of view, a wide range of the landscape below, and a closer, narrow field a little more zoomed in. Well, this doesn't look like fun, I murmur, glancing at my watch. Still got a few hours left to kill before nightfall. My anxiety spikes. Nightfall. The living nightmare. And we are a man down. Memories of the previous night flashed on my head, considered in the cold light of the day. I see myself, lips cracked and bleeding, eyes wide and burnt with streaks of weapon flash as the demons scramble up the walls. I see Yuri tumbling over the edge. I feel a secondhand strain across my upper body, and I see Christian crashing down to the floor and bursting into billowing smoke. I close my eyes, and just take a moment to recover. Calm down. No more deaths. No more. Just focus. Focus, Adam. I take a deep breath of cold mountain air. All right. I kill time by doing stretches by sorting through the ration boxes and making myself a cold grim meal. I ensure my water bottles are full and stationed in places for quick access, if needs be, and I read the bible that has been stashed up here. I flick through the pages and find a passage in Psalms that have been circled several times in pencil. I read it aloud to myself in a quiet voice as the breeze blows beyond the walls of the tower. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadows of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust, for He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. I do not know what pinions are, but a little annotation made beside the word reads, feathers, the feathers of God's wings. A cold chill ripples up my spine, and I turn the page. I wonder briefly who made the annotation. April? A few hours ago? Or someone else perhaps? 
Someone stationed in this tower 50 years ago, maybe. Or more. 60? 70? 100? The shadow deepened as the sun sinks low. It won't be long now. My radio crackles. The unexpected noise breaking my train of thought and making me jump. Night falls on that. Comes Charlie's voice. He sounds worn. Stations. I think he says something else too, but the radio becomes fuzzy and static, and I miss it. I crack my knuckles and head to the weapon that looks out and away from the outpost. And the view from here really is staggering. The tips of the mountains disappear way off towards the horizon, and the white of the snow caps glint with amber and orange as the sun drops lower and lower. A bit of sweat butts on my forehead. Another follows. And then, another. I wipe them away with my sleeve. <laughs> this is the worst part, I've decided. This anticipation. This waiting. The gnawing, grinding anxiety. The trembling in my hands, cracked and calloused. Yet to be warmed by exertion and adrenaline. My sweat is slick and grim and icy. I wipe my palms on the side of my uniform, and then minutes later feel the need to do so again. The sun disappears behind the mountains, and the last of the day's light begins to steadily trickle away. The clouds darken overhead, and the shadows begin to merge across the ground. An hour goes by. A long, cold hour. Alina comes through on the radio to ensure that we are all focused and in position. And at last, the tension spikes before it breaks, as the song begins to jump between the distant icy peaks towards us. The song is as discordant as it was the previous night. Worse even, the melody is almost entirely gone. A wail, a broken chorus. I swallow, my throat already dry and I reach out to the nearest bottle of water, taking a quick clumsy swig. I drop it in fright as a voice whispers clear and cold right into my ear from behind. Adam, you are fewer. No more need to be taken. Allow us entry. I spin around to face the voice's source, but the tower room remains empty. The Bible is open where I left it, in a breeze, sends a few of the thin pages flickering from cover to cover. The song grows sharper, the voices clamoring against and on top of each other. And the demons begin to appear in the distance. Dozens of them. Dark, shadowy shapes rippling and scrambling through the cracks and crevices in the mountain towards the outpost. Their arms moving at such a speed as to give them the appearance of spiders scuttling over the dark, snow-lined rocks. I grab the radio and shout into it. Northwest! Demons approaching! Dozens of them! Be ready! I reach for the weapon. The metal is cold against my hands as I clank it up and into position, and deliberately conscious of the silver cross resting against my chest. I fire the first beam, flicking it out into an arc and feeling a warm burst of recoil as the light thunders down like curved lightning into the darkness. It tears to three and sends the fourth into a shower of dust. There's so many. How are we supposed to fight against such a tide? Why are you doing this, Adam? Asks the voice of a demon in my left ear. A female voice, though not one that I recognize. We don't want to hurt you or the others. Please, will you just stand down? No, I mutter through clenched teeth, my voice grim in its defiance. And in that very instant, the demons in the mountains below me promptly changed direction. All of them, or once they were set to stream right past towards the outpost proper, they have now diverted their routes instead. To me, to the tower. To my left, and in the corner of my eye, I think for a second that I see the source of the voice. 
a woman of ever spilling, cascading water like shadow. Her eyes to a pinprick of glowing embers. I shout out loud in terror and scramble away from the weapon, turning to face her. But she is gone, and I am alone. And the Bible flickers through another page, and I hear Christian's words in my head in his thick Norwegian accent. Rule 2. Do not engage verbally with the enemy. I hear that same phrase again, this time in Elena's voice. Idiot, do not engage verbally with the enemy. My blood freezes in my veins. I jump to the weapon and peer through the sights as the demons scuttle their way towards the tower's position from all directions. Fuck. Oh fuck, Adam. What have you done now, you idiot? And why not, Adam? comes the voice of the demon. She sounds a little more solid now, less ethereal. I can almost see her, or some sick apparition of her in the edges of my vision. But every time I turn to look, she vanishes. Are you afraid of ending up like Christian? I am sorry for that. Truly, I am so so sorry. But we are getting desperate. We needed him. Why? I want to ask that. But I bite my damn tongue and turn away, returning to the weapon and firing beam-like blasts out into the icy darkness below. The courtyard and the outpost itself are illuminated with firework-like flames as my comrades face their own battles. I stretch and reach out a hand for my radio, shouting into it again, ignoring the whispers in my ear. More firepower on the tower side of the outpost. Urgent! I shout as the erratic device crackles and fizzles. I'm not cut out for this, clearly. Maybe Elena was right. I just can't seem to stop fucking up. At every opportunity. I clench my jaw and murmur the Bible verse as I send out a screaming blast of weaponized light. My hands tied on the machinery. My refuge and my fortress. I see myself in the top of the tower. A beacon in the darkness, as the froth and surge of the demons below grow stronger and stronger. My God, my God in whom I trust. Please, God, whatever, wherever you are, just save us. Save us from the darkness. My eyes widen and my eyebrows furrow with a burst of brutal, fiery determination. A sudden surge through my shoulders and down my spine. For he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and the deadly pestilence. I will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. I cast away the demon that slithers around the tower, and my hair is blown back from my face as the light spirals down and around across the courtyard and the rocky chops of the mountains. The demons are burst into clattering, smoking bones as their cries of anguish becomes one with taunting and harmonious song across the range. The battle goes on. On and on it goes as the night stretches out and away. And the demons just keep coming. The endless shadowy spiders far below. The lights flash in a man-made storm. The snow falls. I take to the third weapon, the larger piece with the split barrel. And with a chatter through my bones and a rumble through the walls, I watch as four glass-like spheres of intensely glowing light are released from the end. They tumble and drop like stones over the side of the tower, falling for a second, for two, and then they are like, like fire, screaming out in the direction they were aimed, spreading and splitting apart further, then further, a rain of light across the gorge. And all the while, a darkness grows in the mountains opposite, steadily increasing as the hours pass, amassing, writhing. It reminds me of that curious twisted circle from the other night. But this is no abstract shape. You have to focus to really see it. But the shadows are formed in the shape of a man, hunched over and huddled against the mountain. Whenever my focus is elsewhere, I could swear that I see two mist-like eyes watching me from afar. But as is typical with these things, whenever I turn to look directly at it, the image is lost. It becomes just another rough shadow between the peaks. A voice comes through the radio. Hey, bros. By the sounds of it. Adam, tower! 
is all I am able to catch through the crackling static. I grab the device and shout back down it. What? What did you say? What is it? But nothing further comes through. The device cuts off. I run from weapon to weapon, checking all the sites, looking in all directions. But I do not know why April called me. The tide of the demons continues. But, but then I see it. Out there, in the mountains. The gathering, man-shaped shadow. The colossus in the night. It is slowly, unsteadily rising to a stand. One formless, smoke-like hand rests on the mountain. It looks at me. Right at me. And I see it. I see its eyes. And again, the tide converges. My hands freeze on the weapon. I cannot move. I cannot fire. My heart pounds. And like a slingshot from the void, a long dark shape rockets towards my position. It strikes the side of the tower and dust rains down from the roof. I watch as the demons flow towards me. And I hear the sound of a terrible, almighty crack, like thunder in the darkness. I regain control of my senses and grab a hold of the modified javelin, aiming the heavy weapon out into the night. The great shadowy shape of a man between the mountains is way too far away to hit from here. But I flicker the weapon sight and do my best to aim towards the source of the thing that struck the tower. As I look, however, a second of those shadowy arrows tears through the sky towards my position. I flinch, and quick as flash, it strikes the tower in more or less the same place, just up and over to my left. Brick and mortar is sent raining down with clouds of dust and smoke blasting out into the snow. Returning to the weapon with a grimace, I take quick aim and fire, those four burning glass-like balls bursting out from the barrel, tumbling down for a second, for two, and then shooting up and towards the target, splitting into further projectiles as they rain that dazzling light out into the gorge. But this rain is too little and too late. There is a second thunder-like boom and the floor shakes. I release the weapon in alarm and push myself across the floor to the tower's opposite side, as an enormous section of the wall and roof simply breaks away. It collapses with a juddering thud, and then falls slowly to the courtyard below with an almighty crash and rumble. The wind bellows with renewed power into the room, and it chills me to the bone. Snow too is blown in in great swaths as I consider abandoning my post. Rule 5. Keep a constant presence in the tower. Fuck. Fuck. I scramble through the dust and debris to the weapon on the far side, only to realize that it has been lost. Where the weapon was once fixed is now only bare cracked stone. I grab the ledge and look down over the edge, and I catch a glimpse of the mechanism smashed to parts and pieces on the snow-swept ground far below. I lift my gaze and watch in horror as the demons begin clambering their way over the outposts surrounding walls. Some of them seem to struggle with this, despite the fact that the wall is only waist high. Some of the demons visibly diminish in size and form as they pass over, but as more and more of these creatures breach the wall, the easier it becomes for their fellows to follow. They follow the paths made by the trailblazers opting to cross the wall in narrow streams before spreading out again once they're inside the courtyard. I catch sight of movement on the outpost roof in the shadows. Either Elena or April has relocated and new beams of light are sent blasting down to the ground. The light tears through the stream of demons, but there are simply too many. There are just too many. I grit my teeth and grab a hold of the javelin bringing it round with a mechanical crunch and firing a new burst of the four projectiles directly down into the courtyard. The air alights with fire, and the sparkle-like rain pours down across the shadowy spread below to a chorus of charred and rattling bones. A third of those dark, arrow-like shadows streaks through the darkness and hammers into the side of the tower. 
And this one, it's the surest. The entire structure seems to waver as a section of rock and brick is blown the hell to pieces. And another corner of the wall simply drops down and away, exposing the upper floor almost entirely to the natural force of the elements. The wind whips back my hair and makes my eyes water as I grab a hold of the smaller of the weapons, firing off furious further blasts to the source of these new attacks. And the demons clamor up the mountainside. They spill over the wall. I watch with desperate anguish as they begin to throw themselves against the outpost. Rows of them are evaporated in the beams of the weapons. But there are always more. Always. The endless, ceaseless horde. There is another rumble. And to my utter dismay, this section of floor I'm standing on simply collapses. My stomach lurches as I am dropped. Stone clatters all around me and the weapon tumbles forward and over the edge. I swivel on the spot as I slip and stumble, reaching onto something for anything to grab. But my hands catch nothing but air. And down I go. Over the edge. I shout. I shout out loud in panic, throwing out my hand in one last desperate attempt. My fingers scratch down the flooring and I am unable to get a grip. However, it slows my descent just enough for me to bring up my other hand, and I manage to grab instead a ruined section of a wall a little further down the tower. I fell maybe seven or so feet from a position, muscles painfully pulled taut as the brick and stone and the weapon continued their downward trajectory, smashing to pieces on the cold hard ground far below. My feet kick in the air for a moment as I hang there precariously. Then they find a section of broken stone and I'm able to perch. I carefully release my grip to assess my current situation. I stand on a section of ruined tower. There is just enough space for my feet. There is not enough space for me to sit down, however. I look around. There is a hole in the tower's wall just big enough for me to put my hand in, as a kind of hold for me to support myself. But there is nothing else. There is nothing for me to grab onto and no way for me to climb, no way back into the tower, no way back up, and no way down. I'm stuck here, weaponless, and alone. The wind roars past my position, and I lean back against the brick, jaw clenched as I feel a smattering of loose rubble get brushed past my feet and sent tumbling over the edge. Shit, shit, shit. All I can do is watch as the demons rush through the courtyard and the beams of light tear between them as clattering bones are sent bursting out in clouds of smoke and as the creatures continue their relentless assault of the outpost, slamming against the doors, against the windows, against the concrete. I can only catch glimpses in the erratic flashing light, but I swear I can see modest cracks beginning to form and the demons see this too. As soon as the first faint crack appears in the concrete, this becomes their new target. The tide of demons grow larger and larger, swelling and rolling like waves. I turn my head to the side, squinting into the screaming wind, watching as the enormous man made of shadow in the mountains closes his mist like silvery eyes. He crouches down, and is lost to the shadows, his form returning to the darkness between the peaks and the billowing snow clouds. Oh, what are you? I whisper into the night. And in my ear comes a response. I am the spirit of my people. Ask yourself why you are forbidden to converse with us. They are afraid that you will come to understand, to lay down your arms. Adam, we must be allowed entry into the outpost. We are close, now. We have been close before, and unless this is the final attempt, the cycle of blood will continue. I seek only what is mine, Adam. For a moment, a long cold moment, the song in the air is lifted from its chaos into a beautiful yet haunting melody. I do not recognize the language but I can feel the emotional weight of the words nonetheless. 
It is an anthem I am hearing, I decide. An anthem from long, long ago. I close my eyes. For reasons unknown to me, I feel an icy tear slip its way down my cheek. And I see her. A vision in my mind's eye. The woman from the painting come alive in swirling smoke-like mists of gold and silver and black and white. I cannot see her face as it is obstructed by snow and fog and ash. But she is surrounded by fire. Her cross is held high, glinting with amber and yellow in the firelight as sparks drift across my field of vision. She stands on a rocky hill above a clamoring, horizonless crowd. I hear screams. I see hands reaching out for her, scrabbling and scratching through the stone as the smoke thickens darkly in the air. I hear the sound of thunder, the flashing of lightning, and the cracking and crumbling of rock. And as Olga and the Russ turns to face me, and the vision is lost, I find myself stumbling. The air rushes past my face as I begin my fall. The dark swell of the demons beneath me draws closer. The rope knocks past my shoulder. Rope! I swivel as I fall, twisting around and grabbing desperate hold of the rope from the heavens. My entire body weight held in its proverbial arms as it tightens, and I shout out loud in pain as I am carried back to the tower, striking my side against its brickwork heart. But I am alive. Stones tumble down below, and I reorient myself. Hands burning on the rope, feet square against the tower's brick. I crane my neck to look up at the rope source, way overhead. And there, in the storm at the top of the tower, is Yuri. He stares down at me, his eyes wide and wild. Dobri den, Tolbayop! He shouts down at me, and then, in a thick, almost indecipherable accent, he says something else. One more phrase just about caught above the rush of the wind. No idiot man left behind. And with this, he starts to pull on the rope, hauling it up, one hand over the other. Shocked back into life at the sound of clattering bones way below, I try my best to help, to ascend back to the perch, then to clamber back up, using the rope to hold my weight as I do so. After several long, exhausting minutes, Yuri is able to reach out and grab the back of my jacket, and he hauls me onto the uppermost level of the tower. We collapse onto the remains of snow-streaked, rubble-ridden floor, catching our breaths as the lights flash and the demons wail. How the... how the fuck? He snorts and spits, getting back up to his feet and looking down over the edge, examining the nightmare way below. Tower explode. I see. Abandoned post to save idiot. He sighs and shakes his head. A ruin. Polny bestiates. Rule one. We fail. We fail. I look around desperately. There are no weapons up here anymore. Most of the Bibles jumbled off in the explosions. Though a couple still remain. A quick glance over the edge shows us that the courtyard has essentially vanished, and disappeared beneath a black and shadowy tide. There is no way back to the outpost for us now. We are an island in a dark and swirling sea. Trapped. The attention of the demons has diverted from the tower, however. Their focus is bent wholeheartedly on breaching the building. What the hell are we going to do, Yuri? I ask him, but the man does not reply. So with a grunt, I stand up alongside him, and we watch as the demons battle the beams and the clouds drift and crackle overhead. The shadows and the lights clash with flurries of sparks and geysers of smoke. The silhouette of a woman on the outpost roof glimmers in and out of focus. Elena, it must be. But the night plows on. In the outpost, to my utter amazement, holds for the bulk of it. It holds against this furious tide. 
but twenty or so minutes before the sunrise. The walls finally break. A section of concrete surrounding the thick doorframe breaks through, and as the dust pours out, the demons pour in, scrabbling and heaving over each other as they flow through the gap in the wall, dozens upon dozens all dragging themselves inside, arms and legs blurred into the dark. The others continue to fight. Elena, Charlie, and April. The weaponized light is temporarily paused as they presumably move to barricade up the routes onto the roof. And then they resume. Energy renewed. Swords of cold in the wintry gloom. Whistling, burning beams, and the growing mass of charred, blackened bones. Hang in there, guys. I will to them, clenching my fists. Hang in there. They hold the line as best as they can, all light now focused on the gap in the wall. The battle rages. Then, at long, long last, the shadows start to peel back, and the sun rises, and the snow and the wind ease off, and the natural light of the day is gradually returned to the world. And the song quickly tapers off to be lost on the breeze, and the last of the demons tear across the ruined courtyard to the gap in the wall, smoking and steaming as they do so. Some of them are slowed, as if stuck and entrapped, and they melt away into oblivion, and that thick, tarry smoke drifting up and away into the air. Others are successful and make it to the gap, but all these stragglers are caught in the beams and evaporated. Yuri and I exchange a look. Some got in though. Some definitely got in. How many? It's hard to tell. But surely, surely no less than fifty. More perhaps. There are no words exchanged. It's time to go and clear out the remainders and to assess the damage. Remainders. I think to myself as we descend the ladder, single file. We're not talking remainders here. We're talking a sizable, dangerous force. Will the sun clear them out? Or are they still in there? What the hell could 50 demons achieve altogether? What have they done? My anxiety spikes with every step of the journey as we reach the floor of the tower with that crappy, pipe-leaking bathroom, as we descend the second ladder, as we make our way back down the stairs, around and around, as we pass by the painting of Olga, Olga of Kiev, Olga of the Russ. We push through the tower store to the world beyond, to wreckage and ruin, broken rock, smashed up stone, and thousands upon thousands of bones, some more blackened than others, but all charred to a degree. They come up almost to our knees, these bones, and they rattle and clatter as we try to kick and shove them aside. He returns and heaves some ribs away with a loud rattling, swearing as he does so, searching beneath them for remains of the weapons, the ones that tumbled from the tower's peak. I reach down myself and pick up one of the bones for a closer look. It's a rib piece, almost entirely whole. I look past it to the sea of bones beyond, and really pay attention to each of the individual parts. Ribs, sections of spine, but I can see them more clearly now. My previous experiences with the bones involved me only seeing them for a split second, clattering down the mountainside out of sight in the dark. But now, they are laying right at my feet, illuminated in the light of the rising sun. They are stuck to each other with a thick, viscous black tar-like substance. But they are quite obviously human, I realize. Human-shaped and sized at the least. There are broken hip bones, pieces of arm and leg, an almost complete arm and a hand still loosely connected with that disgusting tar rests on a charred, cracked and decidedly human skull right by my foot. I swallow, my mouth dry, my lips peeling from the icy wind. I look over to Yuri, 
and the men stance back up with armed force of broken machinery. The bulk of one of the weapons from the top of the tower. Or, to be more accurate, its remains. He nods and grunts at me, and we continue, heading across the courtyard, my hands going for my gun as we draw closer and closer to the gap in the concrete. I've scarcely had to use the thing so far, but the images of Elena shooting down Christian's possessed body return to the forefront of my mind. The sound of gunfire from within the complex sends a hammer through my heart, and we break into a run, onwards in aid of our comrades. The morning light is clear now, bright and sparkling through the thick, heavy glass of the outpost windows. Yuri dumps the equipment he is carrying at a crossroads in the corridor and begins tearing through it, rebuilding and reorganizing the mechanisms with his bare hands at lightning speed. He shouts something at me, but it's in Russian, and I don't understand. I get the idea though, I think. I raise my weapon and move from wall to wall, checking the lines of sight down the corridors. The place is full of bones, of broken concrete, of thick, sludgy tar splattered way up to the ceiling. I hear a crash and another series of gunshots coming from down the hall to my right. I know what's down there. It's the room that Charlie showed me, with the little hole scratched and torn away through the floorboards. The meeting hall, or whatever it was. Yuri, I know where they are. He snorts and spits and makes a gesture with his hand. Go on then, it seems to say. And so do I. I head down the corridor with careful focus, looking this way and that for any signs of a struggle before rounding the corner and glancing through the open doorway to the meeting room. There is a demon inside. That much is clear. Elena and April are in there also. I look back at Yuri and make a gesture with my hand. He swears on his breath, nods, and grabs up the remains of the weapon with a few final adjustments. We breach the room, loudly and clearly. Elena and April take hasty steps towards a pile of stacked up chairs in the corner, and the demon crashes from wall to wall like a trapped bird, sticking itself to the ceiling and slithering rapidly across the concrete. It moves like water, with the consistency of smoke. Every now and then, the rough glimpse of a humanoid shape becomes clear in its form. There is a lot to take in at once. The room is a wreck for starters. Where once there was a small hole, barely even waist height, it is now enormous, cavernous, a huge gaping dark void in the center of the floor. Concrete and wood have been thrown and torn up with reckless abandon and hurled to the sides of the room, and, to my utter and total horror, there is movement down below, movement in the dark. Death time, mutters Yuri from behind me, and he pulls back the trigger of the weapon in his hands. It starts to burn, brighter and brighter, and using a makeshift catch that he has evidently constructed in the last few minutes, he locks the trigger in place and throws the weapon down into the hole. The beams blast out in a furious circle, whizzing and sparking and screaming with a brilliant white flame. My awe in the power of the light only seems to intensify it further, and I find myself being dragged from the room along with Elena and April as the fire burns and splatters the walls with shattering bones and great explosive bursts of that thick black tar. We come to a stop around another of the corners, sweating from the heat. But even here, the light is of an intensity I have not yet seen. It is dazzling, blinding almost. I have to shield my eyes, though before I do so, I catch a glimpse of Yuri with his eyes already closed, clutching his cross, muttering to himself under his breath over and over and over. The screaming of the demons grow louder and louder, the smashing, clattering bones like a constant heavy rain. But after a while, these sounds all start to die down. The light fades. The screeching of the demons grow weaker and weaker. Until at last, it falls completely silent. 
Joseph's four, breathing heavily in this battered, bruised corridor of the complex. Christ! April murmurs after a beat, her chest rising and falling as she looks between us. Elena swallows, sweat budding on her forehead, and she leads the way, returning to the room with her back straight and weapon raised. But the room is empty now. And there is no sign of life at all, or whatever imitation of life it is that these demons boast. The hall is covered in that disgusting tar and bones litter the floor. The great deep hole in the room center is dark with the splatter remains, but there is no movement. Footsteps behind us bid us all swivel at once, though it's only Charlie. I am relieved to see that he appears himself. His eyes are as they should be, and he nods at us grimly as he approaches. We didn't do so well last night, did we? He asks rhetorically. He claps me on the shoulder. Good to see you're alright though, mate. I was worried about you, seeing that tower come down. Yeah, I reply, uneasily, still shaken. Yeah, Yuri, uh, well, I fell off after one of the explosions. Yuri was able to haul me back up. Elena's eyes flicker over to him, and she asks him something in Russian. Yuri shakes his head in response, and says nothing further. Time to check out what the bastards were after then, eh? Charlie mutters, reaching to his belt with his guard, calloused hands trying out his flashlight and flicking on the switch. Elena clenches her jaw as Charlie angles the light down into the massive hole that the demons have carved into the rock beneath the outpost. Jesus, would you look at that? He mutters. What the... April says with white eyes. Yuri raises his eyebrows and reaches for his own flashlight adding his beam to Charlie's, and we all peer down into the dark. The hole is much deeper now, of course. I crouch down at its edge and squint into the gloom. I can see a little better what I failed to see the other night. The hole opens up in a white cavern, an enormous hollow cavern, right here beneath the outpost. A cavern filled with rows and rows of still and silent statues. They are all arranged in rows, like some terracotta army. But there are women and children amongst the men. These rows of people made of stone extend away in the darkness on all sides. It's impossible to tell how many there might be. Yuri casts his beam over the only visible wall in the cavern down below. The light illuminates a series of runes carved into the rock. I squint. Beneath the lines of large text, or what appear to be an early form of Cyrillic. Like Russian, but not quite. There's something inherently primitive about it. He remutters under his breath and stares at Elena, wide-eyed. What the hell are those statues? April asks quietly. This... This is what the demons were trying to reach? Movement in the cavern below sends a tremor of fear through the group like electricity. It all happened so quickly. A man, a human man, rises suddenly out of the shadows. His hand on the shoulder of a nearby statue. He stares up at us and screams. Spittle flying from a mouth of broken teeth. His clothes are ragged and rope-like. Ancient looking really. And he wears a helmet of dull metal, carved with two ram-like horns on either side. He raises a hand in a quick, blurred motion, pointing towards us. No, not at us. At... Elena. And I have just enough time to cover my closest ear as Elena promptly raises her weapon. Wait! Charlie shouts out, 
but she does not. A shot rings out loud and clear, and the mysterious man in the cavern below goes down like a rock. Dark blood is sprayed across the wall from the back of his head, and the light is lost as the attention of the flashlight bearers turn to Elena. She stares down into the dark, her eyes wide. Her lips curl back into a sneer, tightening that ghastly scar. Then she turns away and begins to walk from the room. Charlie stumbles over his words. He calls after her. Eh, Elena, what the, what the fuck is going on here? You know something, don't you? April's eyebrows furrow in anger, and she shouts at the Russian as she reaches the doorway. What is happening, Elena? You need to tell us what is going on. Enough is enough. Even Yuri watches the woman in confusion. He cocks his head. He clenches and unclenches his jaw and mutters something in Russian. Elena pauses at the door and she turns back to us, such that only the good half of her face is visible. Concrete mix is in shed on south side. Concrete chunks and rocks can be moved to block gaps. Skeletons cleared. We work for one hour. We sleep for five. Then we work again. Wall sealed before nightfall. They will come again. You really are hiding something, aren't you, Elena? Charlie mutters, his eyes narrowing as he wipes some dust from his nose. Elena says nothing more. She simply takes her leave. And we listen to the sound of her footsteps as they gradually disappear down the corridor. After a long, cold pause, I turn to Yuri. Yuri, I begin carefully. Please, man, is there something you can tell us about Elena that she is hiding? I don't know what it is, but let's face it. Does she seem all that surprised by the discovery down below? I mean, statues of people in the dark beneath the outpost? I thought this was about ley lines or whatever. Yuri, is she hiding something from us? The man's cheek twitches. His dark, shadowed eyes look between us as we regard him. Then he sighs and spits onto the ground. He mutters in Russian, then says in English, Work to do. Fix wall. And away he goes. And that's that. As badly as the questions are now burning, the walls take priority. We spend the next hour in relative, contemplative silence. Charlie and I mix rapid setting concrete. April clears the bones and the blood. I catch sight of Elena in the courtyard, carefully redrawing the various symbols across the walls in white chalk, where the demons scrubbed them away. I notice that she seems to be focusing on the Christian ones the most. We get those five hours of sleep, and goddamn they are badly needed. They pass by far too quickly, however, and like a zombie, I rise to return to work. The gap in the wall is hastily fixed back up with the chunks of broken concrete and the sloppy mix of the new batch. The work is not aesthetic, but it might just do. Yuri searches through the bones for the remains of the weapons and disappears off to some workshop to try and fix them up. We are unable to entirely fix the enormous hole in the meeting hall floor, but we do manage to narrow it down somewhat, and the area above it is heavily nailed over with ugly planks of wood and with materials we are able to locate in the storerooms. What gets me is how poorly prepared the outpost is to fix up this damage. I mean, yes. The concrete mix is available, but the variety of materials at our disposal is incredibly limited. And I can't help but wonder. Hell, do command even know what lies beneath this place? My mind whirls as I work, as supplies where able are restocked. Statues beneath the outpost. A man killed in cold blood. He wasn't possessed, was he? He didn't move like Christian did. He didn't send out a dozen voices at once the way Christian did either. 
he seemed just human. I rubbed my hands across my eyes. The demons are trying to get beneath the outpost. They are trying to reach the cavern. They are trying to reach the statues, right? Is that it? But why? What do the demons want with a load of carved rock? Uh, I feel like the answer is right in front of me. I'm just missing one or two pieces of the puzzle. Elena. Elena. What do you know, Elena? I start to grow angry. Like April was earlier. How dare she keep secrets from us? We're putting our lives here at risk for... For what? Why are we defending this godforsaken outpost in the middle of the fucking mountains? April is just beside me. And I slam down a chunk of concrete with a cloud of dust. And I turn to her. She looks over and reads my expression, grimacing. What are we going to do about her? I ask. It's obvious who I'm talking about. I don't know. She replies with a sigh. Do we just go and comfort her? She scares me, Adam. The way she shot that guy in the cavern. I mean, who was he? Elena knows. Except, what if she doesn't? Would she do that? Kill someone in cold blood without any information at all? What does she know? I think we should find Yuri. Yuri? He's not going to help us. No, I think he might. He's changed in these last couple of days, April. Ever since he was dragged over the edge. He's been unsettled for a while now. And I don't think he and Elena are on quite the same page as we thought they were. April hesitates. Come on, I say. Let's go find him. He isn't in any of the places we check, however. He isn't in the workshops. He isn't in comms or anywhere near the tower. We start to become frustrated, then worried. I don't want to call for him over the radio because I'm a little cautious of Elena overhearing. But at long last, we locate him, huddled up in the corner of an archives room. Dusty old folders and files laid out before him, illuminated in the glow of an ancient lamp. Yuri, I mutter, and the guy glances up at me. What? What are you doing here, man? And the Russian regards me. His eyes flicker from my face to April's. After a measured pause, he gestures to one of the folders on the ground, kicking it with his foot. I share a glance with April and reach down to pick it up, thumbing open the cover to reveal a series of photocopies and articles, historical records on Olga of Kiev, the woman in the painting. April murmurs something and carefully takes the folder from my hands, flicking through. Most of the content is in Russian, but some appears to be in English. Yuri. I begin, cautiously. You don't know, do you? You don't know what Elena's hiding from us. The man considers me, and then shakes his head. A pipe hisses softly overhead, and the light flickers. There was writing on the wall in the cavern, in Russian, and there was some in another language too. It looked a little like runes. But the Russian, were you able to read it? He shrugs and grunts. He chops the file in his hands onto the desk with a thud. Old, he says simply. Very big old. A long time. Sealed away, they said. Locked away. And. And what? He runs his tongue over his teeth. Drivlian. Drivlian? Yuri nods. I don't understand. What does that mean in English? Devil? Demon? He shakes his head. Means nothing. It's same in English as Russian. Drivlian is word. Drivlian. 
I run the word through my head. But it means nothing to me. April suddenly reaches out a hand and she grabs me by the arm. I jolt in surprise and turns to look at her. But the woman is staring intently down at the page. Her eyes wide. Adam? She mutters. You gotta read this. There's something here that... That... She is interrupted by a crackling on the radio. That... Comes Charlie's voice, grainy and far away. I think you might want to make your way to the front door. We have a guest. A guest? Too damned much is happening at once. But the three of us don't need much convincing. We're up at once and marching down the corridors, quickly between the scarred walls of the complex to the gate of the outpost far side. The one I passed through on my very first day here. Yuri mutters to himself in Russian. A guest? I say out loud. Is someone here? Elena only called for backup yesterday morning. There's no way Christian's replacement could be here already, right? She said it would take way longer. Adam, April hisses. I really, really do need to talk to you. But we reach the gate. Charlie is there, as is Elena. And they part to allow us a view into the courtyard beyond. Into the grim, grey haze of the evening. And there, to my utter shock, stands a man I recognize. A man from my base. And a man I am well, well familiar with. He stares at me. And I at him. Uh... Hi, guys. The man says, with an awkward wave, his accent the same as mine. It's good to meet you, I think. He glances down to the pile of chart bones in which he stands. The name is Adam. Adam Smith. Reporting for duty. The others look from him to me and back. I fumble for words as a cold gust of wind blows into the outpost. You... you're the replacement for Christian? I manage. And the other Adam raises an eyebrow. Christian? He replies. Christian? Repeats another voice. A grizzled man pokes his head inside from around the corner. It's Sokolov. Officer Sokolov, the same Russian officer that led me here. When exactly? A week ago, maybe? Feels like fucking months. Everyone inside salutes, myself included, and the man returns it, bidding us to ease with a grunt and a wave. Elena steps forward and asks something of the man in Russian. He replies and gestures from Adam to me. I hear him mention Christian's name, and Elena sadly shakes her head with her response. Sokolov sighs and looks to the ground. Shame, he says in English. I will miss that one. A big loss. Wait, sir. I cut in, stepping forwards down the corridor myself. You didn't know that Christian was dead? Then what's Adam doing here? Well, I'm here to replace you, man. Adam says. <laughs> Turns out you were never supposed to be up here in the first place. I'm the one they wanted to send. Jesus. I reply, sucking some air in through my teeth. I knew nothing of Christian till now, Sokolov says. I do not deal with this. If a replacement requested, then he will be here. I do not know where from. One of the others will be bringing them up, when available. He points at me. You, Smith, duty over. 
Congratulations. Time to go. And he half turns, expecting me to follow. The others turn to look at me. Charlie, April, Yuri, and Alina, all watching. I consider it, you know. I consider going with Sokolov. I mean, why shouldn't I? I've done my time. I did my duty. I answered the call when the call should never have gotten to me in the first place. It was all a fuck up. A classic logistical blunder. I mean, I had my suspicions. But I really thought that with something like this, the aboves would have been more careful. I guess I was wrong. But still, I can't just go. Not now. If I stay, sir, then we have the six. The six required for the optimal running of the outpost. I turned to Elena. That's right, isn't it? Despite all this space, all these empty rooms, six is the magic number. That's what you said. Six defenders. Elena opens her mouth, hesitates, then cautiously agrees. She turns to Sokolov. This is true, sir. She says, then goes to say some more in Russian. And Sokolov regards her, then me. And then, he just shrugs. You want to stay? Stay. You were offered way home. Remember this. He takes a step back, his coat rustling in the wind. As I said, if you requested replacement for Christian, then they will be here within day, maybe two, maybe three. Weather depends. Goodbye. We stand to attention and salute, and he nods one back. Then away he goes, turning on his heels and clattering back through the bones, scarcely giving them a second glance. He does call back over his shoulder though, one more time before he disappears into the haze. Shame about Tower. We'll inform command. Hopefully fixed by end of this quarter. And that's that. I can just about make out his silhouette, clambering over the little wall that surrounds the outpost. And then he vanishes, leaving the six of us in the open gate of the outpost. Adam Smith looks between us, perhaps catching a glimpse of the exhaustion, the ever-flickering, quietly burning fear that now shimmers in all our eyes. He looks down again at the bones. He swallows. So, would anyone care to explain this, uh, situation to a newbie like myself? He asks, with a weak, dry laugh. No one laughs with him, and the man is led grimly through the outpost and into the hexagon. We sit in silence for a while as Adam eats from a can of Russian meat mush of some kind. His chewing and the occasional hiss of a pipe in the walls are the only sounds. Snow falls slowly and silently beyond the glass. Adam keeps opening his mouth as if to speak, then deciding against it, choosing instead to simply shovel in more meat mush, unsure if he actually wants any answers, or if he'd prefer to live a little longer in blissful ignorance. At last, he can stand it no longer and he turns in his seat to face me. Adam, what's going on, man? What the hell happens here? Russians and Americans together? What's the deal with that? Russians and Americans together. Yes, that too was my first concern when I arrived here. I scarcely even consider this international anomaly at all now, compared to all the surreal nightmarish nonsense that is thrown at us here on the regular. The fact that we're working with the army of the Russian Federation barely even registers as a flicker in my thought processes. I'm gonna level with you men. I tell him, breaking the unofficial seal my comrades and I have been keeping. This place is dangerous. We fight demons here. Adam laughs, and as before, no one joins him. I stare at him, blank-faced. You're kidding, right? He asks. Demons? Come on, man. Are you religious, Adam? I ask him. I don't think I've ever asked you before. Well, no. 
he says in response. No, not really. You will be. April, Charlie and I all murmur in unison. Demons? Is this a joke? Adam stands up, angrily. Stop fucking around. Do you have any idea what I had to go through to get here? Our helicopter nearly crashed in a damn storm. Elena herself rises to her feet. The other Adam is a little taller than myself, but she stands higher than even he. And I can feel the secondhand frost of her arctic clear pouring into this newcomer. American Yets, she mutters, glancing over to Yuri. Yuri, however, says nothing. To my great interest, he simply looks down to the floor. I catch a fleeting scowl on Elena's face. Maybe even a touch of concern, perhaps. But she lets it go. Adam takes a step back, awkwardly, and then strides over to me. He gets right up to my face, though I don't flinch. Adam, he says, desperately. Come on, what the hell is this? Demons? We're not fighting demons. That's a fucking joke. What are we doing here? I pause. You know what? Maybe you're right, Adam. Perhaps you should be addressing your questions to Elena here instead. I look over to her, my gaze heavy, and I know that she can feel its weight. The snow falls, and the tension in the room tightens somewhat. April stares at me. I can see her in the corner of my eye. Her lips remain sealed, but the meaning behind her paranoid expression is clear. Adam, it says, are you sure about this? If we confront her directly, there might be no going back. We don't know what she's capable of. The blood in my body begins to chill considerably as Elena's eyes pour back into mine. Her mouth twitches, and it pulls that scar grotesquely across her cheek. I stand up. Elena, it's time to share with us what you've been hiding. I simply don't know what we're fighting anymore. I'm realizing that I never really did. Please, just tell us the truth. What are we fighting? Why have you dedicated yourself so wholeheartedly to this outpost? Why six? Why six people only? And who are you? April asks in a quiet, almost imperceptible voice. I do not know what you're talking about. Elena replies levelly, all eyes fixed on the woman as the wind blows with a sudden, renewed force beyond the walls. The snow is whipped into a frenzy. We don't have long to go till nightfall now, chaps. Charlie mutters. He remains seated at the back of the room, but as with us all, his eyes are on Elena. Elena, come on. You know something. It's obvious. Just share with the group, and we can all move on. I don't have time for this. Elena mutters and turns to take her leave. She finds herself blocked, however. Yuri, having risen from his seat, has stepped in her way, blocking her path from the room. This is ridiculous, she says, then points at Yuri and barks something in Russian. Yuri shakes his head, his hands by his sides. Elena scoffs and tries to go for another exit, and this time she is blocked by Charlie, likewise rising up from his seat to stand in her way. You people are crazy. We defend outpost. That is our job. With a sudden and surprising sob of anguish, Elena reaches down to her belt. To her gun, perhaps. Maybe not. But every single person in the room catches the motion. And before Elena's hand reaches her waist, four weapons are drawn, cocked, and aimed directly at her. Whoa, Jesus, what the... Adam begins but his surprise is lost beneath the shouting. Elena's face crackles with fury. It's an almost palpable electricity, a current running between the six of us. Yuri! She shouts into the man's face, her forehead thudding against the butt of her rifle. Let me pass. How could you do this to your own comrade? Her words blur into Russian, rife with expletives. 
Sweat buds on my forehead and leaks in little trickles down my neck. Elena swivels to face me and the sweat freezes against my skin. Elena, stand down. I mutter. I'm sorry. I don't want to shoot you, obviously. Elena strides towards me and I raise the gun higher, stumbling in retreat, shouting now. Elena, stop! Stop now or I will shoot! She hesitates and bares her teeth at me. I do not know the answers. I know nothing. I guard outpost, like you all. Yuri tuts and shakes his head. He grunts something in Russian under his breath. Elena responds to this with a sharp 180, pulling back her fist and smashing it into Yuri's nose. Blood splatters against the wall and Yuri scrambles backwards, shaking his rifle in Elena's face and shouting at her in loud, very angry Russian. We're all shouting again now, but Elena pays it no mind. You will not shoot me. All too soft. Need me to stay alive regardless. Kill me and all die. Why? I ask her, pleading in my voice. Why, Elena? Why do we need you to stay alive? What are you to this place? I lower my weapon with a sigh and slump back into my chair, running my hand through my hair, the tension trickling away. It's pointless. Elena's right, but we're not going to shoot her, and we all know it. We're putting our lives on the line. We came close to a total loss last night. The demons almost got what they wanted. Perhaps some of them did. I turned to her, but we don't know what they want. How can we effectively defend when we don't know even the simple fact? It might be easier tonight with Adam here, but why? Why is six better than five? Is it better than seven? Elena clenches her jaw and regards me. Come on, Elena. Pashalusta. Please. The gears turn in Elena's head as she rubs the bruise forming across her knuckles. Then, she too simply slumps down in a chair with a sigh, one directly opposite me. Charlie and April cautiously lowered their weapons, though Yuri does not. Elena glances over to him and shouts. Yuri mutters something to himself and reluctantly does as she says, lowering his weapon. He keeps it in his hands, however, and chooses to take a seat at a far distance. There are six needed to guard the outpost. Elena begins wearily, her voice passionless. She sounds tired. So, so tired. No more than six. Too many people here is like pouring blood into the sea. All those heartbeats, all those thoughts, feelings, fears. The enemy comes like sharks. They came like sharks last night. Charlie says from his position. And there were only five of us. So what happened? What changed? They got themselves a taste of what it is they are after. Driven to bloodlust, I guess. They share a consciousness. You all saw it previous night. The shadow in mountains. The giant. The spirit of the... of the enemy. Elena wavers, then continues. We suffered so greatly last night because we were without Christian. Christian specifically. I don't understand. I murmur. And why Christian specifically? We'll be okay tonight, right? We have the six. We have the new Adam. Adam Smith, Elena says, looking up at last to our newest member. How was your childhood? He regards her. Uh, I'm sorry? Your childhood. Good or bad? Simple question. Well, good I guess. Pretty damn good. My parents were- Yeah, she says with a dismissive wave. Didn't ask for your life story. She sighs. Tonight will be hard. Christine was good defender because he understood the truth of suffering. He and I were 
We were good friends. I like to hope. Something shimmers in Elena's eyes, and she wipes them with the back of her bruised hand, half turning away. My childhood was not good. It was bad. Very, very bad. I understand what it means to suffer when suffering was not deserved. More than most. Christine understood this too. We were shields. Shields against the enemy. The greater your understanding of suffering, the greater the strength of the outpost, and the greater the resistance to the demons. She looks around the room. Yuri, I know childhood was not great, but was fine. And you, Westerners. She looks from Charlie to April, to Adam and to myself. You do not know suffering in its purest form. Your use here is limited. I try to process this. But I thought we had spiritual resistance or whatever. The ley lines. The ley lines are real. The supernatural resistance real. That is why you're here. But even despite this, your use is limited. So I don't command just send soldiers with shit childhoods then? April asks. Why don't our governments just send people with awful upbringing? Because, Elena cuts in angrily, they do not know. No one knows, except I know. Christian knew, and now all of you know too. And you must keep it a secret. You must. If I believe you intend to share this secret with anyone, I will kill you. I am not joking. She looks between us, one by one. Why? I ask. Why is this secret so important to keep? To pizza. Elena sighs, shaking her head. Think about it. Governments want to defend outpost. What do you think governments do if they know they can defend it more securely with soldiers who have suffered as children? I open my mouth, but say nothing. Elena continues. Government will create these soldiers. They already send soldiers from the ley lines. If they know, they will be better soldiers for having suffered. They will take them and they will make them suffer. And I will not allow this. Never. Never ever. No one will suffer like I did. No one will go through what I had to go through. They wouldn't. April murmurs. No government would do such a thing. I mean, the Russians might. But, but the American government? No, they'd never do anything so cruel. Her words hang dead in the air. Wouldn't they? Elena mutters quietly. And darkly, we considered this. All right, I say slowly. So, so that I suppose I can understand. But the enemy, they're not demons, are they? They can't be. There's just no way the more I think about it. We're not battling the forces of hell here, are we? But they respond to the religious stuff, to Christianity. Why? Why is that? Drivlin. Yuri grunts, scratching the stubble across his chin. We fight Drivlin. The word on the wall of the cavern. That is what Yuri was researching in the archives. What's he talking about? It's an accusation. He waits for Elena to confirm his words. And at last she does. She turns to look out of the window and she nods. Yes. The Trivlin. That's what we are fighting. Not demons. But people. A race of people called the Trivlin. They were all destroyed. A thousand years ago. A name lost in time. They became slowly. The Trevils. The Devils. And then... Simply, demons. The Trevlian, Charlie repeats. Never heard of them. And who the fuck might they be? And why do they want to access this building so bloody badly? Elena closes her eyes. She takes a slow, deep breath. And she tells us the story. She tells us the story of the Trevlian and of Olga of Keefe. The woman in the painting. The Trevlian were, so she says, 
an ancient race of people who lived in what is now Eastern Europe over a thousand years ago, vaguely Slavic in ethnicity, with their own customs, stories, aspirations and anthems. Elena believes the song we hear across the mountains at night to be the song of the Drevlian people. A man named Oleg of the Rus led the dominant nation in the region at the time, and the Drevlians, amongst the other tribes and peoples of Eastern Europe, were expected to pay tribute and swear him their loyalty, an oath of service in exchange of Oleg's defenses. Upon Oleg's death, however, the Trevelyan lords changed their minds at a midnight council in the midst of a snowstorm. It was decided that they would abandon the other people and choose to immediately halt their tribute and not promise of fealty. Oleg's successor was a man named Igor, Igor of Kiev, a man who made many mistakes, a man misguided, but a good man all the same, a man who did his best by his people. Igor, unsure how to approach the Drevlians, initially sent an armed force to their capital to demand what he was owed, and was met with indignation and verbal hostility, and he returned with a meager tribute, far less than what was promised. Then, what was owed? Not wanting to escalate matters any further, Igor for a second attempt traveled to the wintry home of the Trevlims himself, to speak to their leaders personally, and to fix what he hoped was little more than a freight threat of diplomacy. Elena pauses for a moment as she reaches this part. She swallows and rubs her throat. And she tells us that the Trevlians saw the situation a little differently. They murdered Igor of Kiev by tying his legs to birch trees, the trunks bent and trembling and held in place with ropes and nets. Once Igor had been secured, and the Trevlian lords had posted the breaking of their oath, the nets and the ropes were released. The trees in all their might and power sprang back to their original opposite positions, and Igor was promptly torn in two. There are apparently accounts from those present that say they saw his bones burst right out from his body, though of course, there is no way to verify now if such was true. Igor's death was felt across the region, but by no one greater than his loving wife, Olga, Olga of Kiev, Olga of the Rus, the woman depicted in the tower's painting. Whilst the Trevlians celebrated their freedom, Olga's soul was twisted and burnt into a driving force for vengeance, for revenge, for justice. The Trevlians, emboldened by their newly found freedom, gloated to Olga, and as the first female ruler of the Rus, she was perceived as a little more than a pliable weakling. The Trevlians were wrong. They did not see. They did not see the arctic fire that burned behind her eyes. They did not see the frost that formed with her every waking breath. They did not see when the first train of their boastful ambassadors were buried alive, scrabbling and scratching and screaming in the perpetual darkness. They did not see when the second were tricked and trapped into a lock and burning building, reduced to a little more than charred and blackened bones. And they did not see when Olga, acting the meek and wicked woman, requested an overdue funeral for her husband Igor at the sight of his death. Her request was granted, and as she wept for what was lost in the Trevlian capital, the Trevlians drank. And drunkenly, they plotted their plans for the future. They wagered on who would be the one to marry Olga of Kiev. And as the night progressed, they were slaughtered in the thousands. Olga's Russes killed each and every noble, guard and soldier present, and the city was set ablaze. It was only then that the Trevlians began to see. Russes reinforcements circled around and pushed their enemy easy, and one by one, the cities of Trevlian were raised. Every plea. Every desperate request for peace and for surrender were met with little more than wind. Olga never ceased. She never stopped. Onwards, she marched with her soldiers, 
be driving the Drevlian ever back. On one late day of the slaughter, Olga halted and commanded her forces to wait. A message was sent out. The hearts of the unbattled people leapt when at last, at long long last, it seemed that Olga of Kief would finally show them mercy. After all, their lords and nobles were all now dead, buried or burnt or slashed to pieces, and the last of the Drevlian people were besieged in the final city still standing, their lone bastion. Olga, promising peace, demanded only one final tribute. Six birds. Just six. Six birds from each household, as a promise of freedom and the war's end. The Trevelyans were relieved, and they gladly accepted, and the tribute of the great flock was swiftly made and delivered to Olga herself. Olga had no intention of forgiving the Trevelyan, however. As she stood amongst this host of birds, she commanded her soldiers to attach to each and every one a string of sulfur and racks of cloth. Then, when the sun set that day, the sulfur was set alight, and the birds were released. The orange of the glow was set to shine in Olga's eyes as the sky began to sparkle with a hundred thousand embers. The birds did as Olga knew they would. They returned to their homes, to their nests, and the rafters and roofs of the houses and buildings of the Trevelyans. And all at once, the wood began to burst into flame. The city was a burning wreck within the hour, and there was nothing its inhabitants could do but run, to flee yet further still. They were chased by Olga's soldiers, for hundreds and hundreds of miles east, away across the wastes. And there, at the base of the Ural Mountains, when they could go no further, they banded together, the Trevelyans, for one desperate final stand. They were the men still standing, they were the women, they were children, they were elderly. They were not warriors nor fighters, but they still numbered over a hundred thousand. And in those final hours, they all felt the end, and they all prepared to fight, as only one backed into a corner truly can. They still had their hope. Olga, however, did not plan to fight. She would not accept a single further drop of rust blood being spilled for these demons. And so as the Trevelyans were steadily encircled, it came to pass that she burst from the shadows behind them atop a rocky hill, her cross in hand and shining in the reflection of the fire her soldiers placed in the darkness. Her robes whipped about her body in the growing windstorm, and she stood defiant as she began to chant, as she raised that cross up high. And, in the name of her god, she swore to tear the Trevelyan souls right out from their bodies, to tear them to pieces as they had torn apart her beloved. She roared with a power the Trevelyans had not yet seen. Christianity was unknown to these people. They did not know the cross. They were afraid of the strength of her conviction in this foreign Abrahamic mysticism, and that in turn gave it a power unique to that moment of madness. Whether God himself was involved is not certain, nor is the certainty of his existence. But on the Trevelyan's final day, it was Olga's power, channeled through her cross, that led to the end of their story once and for all. Their souls were ripped from their bodies and cast out into the waste as shadows. There would be no peace for the Trevelyans, no eternal rest or slumber, only suffering endless, maddening suffering. The only material substance that was left of the Trevelyan people were soulless bodies of a rock-like, chalky crust. And these husks were carried one by one up through the cracks of the mountains, where they would be sealed away in a dark, deep, near unreachable cavern. Olga made sure to carve into the cavern's walls the nature of their crimes, with a warning that they would remain here for eternity with no rest, and no respite. And there, the story ends. The scattered, twisted souls of the Trevelyan eventually found their cavern. But 
the descendants of the Rus meant an eternal guard. The reason as to why gradually lost through the centuries. An eternal guard that had largely held off the attacks on the outpost. Until now there is. Until me, with a mistake as idiotic as a mix-up with names. Elena trails off, and we all stare off into space, taking in the gravity of this outrageous knowledge. But, but what about the other outposts? I murmur. Christian said there was one in Australia. India, he said. I know what he said. Elena interrupts. He said those things because that's what I told him. I lied. There are no other outposts. There is this and only this. There are no other outposts. So, it's just this one then. Just us six. Alone in the mountains. Adam and I were born in the same place. I say out loud, giving voice to another thought that's been nagging at me. We were both born on the same ley line. Our supernatural resistance should be the same, no? So why has shit hit the fan only recently? Elena snorts. I told you this at the beginning. You are not like the others. You are childish and immature. You simply have a dangerous personality. You are type to bring chaos and calamity wherever you go. You have not suffered, Adam. And you are still to suffer this outpost. Yuri says something in Russian on his breath. Elena shoots him a look. I think in that moment about my brother. About his death ten years ago. I push aside the false voice that the demon, the traveling, eased into my head. And I remember my brother's true voice. His presence. His warmth. I have done my share of suffering, Elena. I say quietly. But thanks. Still, maybe things would have been different if the correct Adam had been sent in my place. Maybe Christian would still be alive. Maybe the tower would be undamaged. Maybe the cavern beneath us would still be sealed away. I guess we'll never know now. So why the hell are we doing this? April asks, pressing her palms against her eyes for a moment. We're stopping the Drevlian souls from reaching their bodies. I get that. But I still don't understand why. Why don't we just let them return? Let this whole thing end. Be done with it once and for all. Then no one will need to stay in the outpost. It can be decommissioned. For one simple reason. Elena replies. If a Drevlian soul returns to body from which they were separated, they are flooded in an instant with a thousand years of hatred, of bitter rage, anguish. A being is not meant to exist for so long. Return to material world, they find themselves displaced, out of sync. They are dangerous and violent, and brimming with latent spiritual power. If Drevlians successfully enter the outpost, breach cavern and find bodies, that is over 100,000 mind-broken monsters released into the world. Bloodshed will return, cycle of hatred will continue. She rises to a stand, and I get the sense her speech is drawing to a close. It's getting darker anyway. Not much time left now. Night will be falling soon, and the new Adam still doesn't really have a clue what's going to happen. I stay here in this outpost, because my presence here is greatest shield outpost could ever ask for. And second, to right the sins of the past. Olga's fury back then caused terrible pain and trauma to this part of the world. The story of the Trevlins is brutal, sad, complex. But if those souls return to the bodies, the terror unleashed on further innocence will be Zelizo, iron in his brutality. But, but that's not right. April replies, standing up herself. These people, the Trevlians, these are innocents. They were, they were torn from their bodies. That's what you said. Souls left suffering for a thousand years. It's not right. Who are we to stand in the way of allowing them to return to their bodies for a final chance of peace? And there, Elena says, 
raising her hand in a half point. Is why I keep secret. Easier to battle demon than Drevlian. Less moral compass dilemma. Fucking hell. Charlie says with a sigh. This is some heavy, heavy shit. Jesus. Something inside April snaps. She strides forwards and shouts directly into Elena's face. Are you her, Elena? She says. Are you Olga of Kiev? My first instinct is to snort with surprise. The question is ridiculous. But, but as the question settles into my mind, I take another look at Elena. I conjure up an image of the painting and I try to place them side by side. No, surely not. Surely not. You know everything about it, April says, and I notice that she is trembling. You look like the woman in the painting, though she doesn't have that scar. And, and you've been here for a long time, haven't you, Elena? A long, long time. Decades at the least. You're Olga, and you're trapped here now. Trapped in this outpost in a web of your own making. Elena stares at April. And then, she laughs. The sound is bright and clear, and we watch in shock and cautious amusement as she laughs and laughs and laughs, doubling over a little as she does so. You are kidding, she says, her face displaying a grin I've never even seen her wear before. Joke, you think I am a woman who died a thousand years ago? April falters and takes a step back. She flushes. But, well, I thought, Americans are so funny. This is crazy. Elena snorts and wipes the corner of her eye. I am not Olga, April. April clenches her fists. She strides from the hexagon and into the little side room she showed me several days ago. I hear her rummaging and the clatter of something being knocked from the wall. And she returns a moment later with a framed photograph in her hand. I recognize it as the one with SGH 1987 written on the back. I'd almost forgotten about it. She flips it, undoes the clips, and slides the picture out from the frame. She holds it up to Elena's face. Explain this then. You see what's been written on the back of this picture? SGH 1987. Who is SGH? And how is there a picture of you at this outpost from 1987? You scarcely look any different at all. How is that possible? Elena's grin fades from her face, and she shakes her head with a sigh, her eyebrows furrowed. This is sad, April. You are smarter than this. She takes the photograph and points to the letters and numbers written there. What does this say, April? SGH. April replies, 1987. Elena shakes her head. No, wrong. It says SGH I987. This photo is not from decades ago. It was taken in 2015. April's confidence trickles away. What? But... You know Samsung Galaxy, April? Samsung Galaxy tablets? I... Yeah, I guess. Elena thrusts the photo back into April's hands. This photo was taken with Samsung Galaxy. Samsung Galaxy SGH I987. This is brand of device, not date or initials. I too consider this development. The brand of the phone that took the picture... Is that all it was? It seems almost, almost too stupid to be true. But then again, what the hell do I know? Nothing apparently. Not a damn thing. And regardless, thinking time is up it would seem. The shadows deepen. And before long, the sun will set. It's time to get to our stations.
What are we going to do about the tower? I ask. It's weaponless, and we've broken the rule. No one's been in the thing for hours. We have no choice but to abandon it. Alina replies. We will have to survive the night without it. Everyone to your stations. Adam Smith, you go with old Adam Smith. Defend the outpost. Rule number one, do not allow enemy into outpost. Do not allow the enemy into the outpost. And away she goes. No one tries to block her this time. Still reading from the info traps, heavy with the weight of her newfound knowledge. One by one, we depart for our stations. April drops a small shining silver cross into Adam's hand before she goes. Charlie gives the man a nod and wishes him well. Yuri says nothing to anyone, vanishing silently down a corridor, bringing a cigarette up to his mouth before he disappears completely around the corner. Come on, man. I say to Adam, I guess you're with me tonight. And so, away we go. Up and into the snow. To our station. Doing our duty. Manning the amalgamated weapons to keep away the intruders. The fire in the darkness. Keeping the Drevlians trapped in their eternal cycle of darkness, despair and destruction. Armed with Bibles. Using these holy books as weapons, as Olaf Keith did herself 1,000 years ago. Defending the outpost, as we are all tasked with doing. As Americans, as Russians, as soldiers. The sun sets. The anthem of the Trevelyans begins to play. Quietly at first. Floating note by note across the mountains, as thoughts within thoughts swirl as a maelstrom across the turmoil of my mind. Time passes, the sun rises, this anthem of the long forgotten people plays, and the demons, no, the Trevelyans, begin clambering up and out from the darkness. Adam Smith watches in abject horror as the hordes are sent crawling up the mountainside and towards the outpost. I call out the arrival of the enemy to my comrades, and the first beam is fired. As with every night previous, the battles begin to rage. Bones are sent bursting with clouds of smoke and fire as the beams are cast in all directions, tearing through the shadows like blades through skin. Snow falls, the mists gather. My muscles ripple and burn with the strain as electricity crackles with the frost in the icy air. I task Adam Smith with reading aloud from the Bible. As with myself, he falters initially, but he gets the hang of it pretty damn quick. He bellows like a preacher out and into the wind, and his voice is carried out into the night. To the Trevelyans, his words must come as a painful, torturous echo of the night they were lost. My heart goes out to them. It really does. But if Elena tells the truth, if these people become monsters the minute they return to their bodies, then is what I'm doing right now the greater good? Or am I just trying to justify this madness to myself? I am no longer certain that what I'm doing is right. I hammer the weapon down with a mechanical thud, and I send a screaming beam down directly below. Tearing through a Trevelyan with his hands outstretched towards me. Its charred and blackened bones are sent flying in all directions. Movement in the night to my left bids me to turn my head. And amidst the mist and fog of the night, I see him again. That enormous man made of shadow between the peaks. The spirit of the Trevelyan personified. And with his arrival, the hordes of the enemy are renewed. Thick and fast they approach, hungry for their price down in the cavern beneath the outpost. I stare at the great shadowy spirit, willing him to turn and face me, and with a slow measured turn of his head, he does so. His eyes of silver lock with mine, and I hear his voice in my head. You know, don't you, Adam? We I see it in your head. You have learned the truth. You know my story. 
and still you fight. Why do you think I don't feel pain when you burn my people to ash upon the mountainside? Rule 2. I remember. Do not engage verbally with the enemy. And as planned, I ignore this rule. I respond, and I ask my question. It's true, isn't it? I whisper. And at once, a great surge of demons adjust their course and clamor directly towards me. It makes no matter. I drop a device that you reconstructed for me. A bomb of sorts that sends sparks of light spiraling in all directions as it disappears down into the darkness below. You are what's left of the Trevlian, and if you reach what you're so desperate for, you'll only bring havoc and chaos and further pain into the world. I grit my teeth and bring the beam around in an arc. Adam Smith is forced to shield his eyes as the rock below is burnt temporarily white with a glare. I'm sorry. I really, really am. But I've had no time to think. I don't know what the best course of action is in the long term. But for now, I can't stand back and allow you entry into this outpost. I cannot allow you to return. Please forgive me. The guilt comes in ebbs and flows. It is cold, but not as cold as the bitterness of the night. I clench my jaw and resume my battle, shouting out a verse of my own as the weaponized light intensifies. These are the people that use my brother's voice against me. The voice of my long-dead brother. These are the people that possessed Christian and brought about his death. You are just like her, whispers the spirit. I thought you were different. Perhaps I was wrong. I want an end to this. Just let us be free. Your bodies remain below the outpost. I mutter back. They must be there for a reason. There must be a reason that they haven't been destroyed. Maybe that knowledge has been lost. Or maybe it's just something else that Elena refuses to tell us. But there is nothing I can do now but my duty. I am a soldier, and these are my orders. I am sorry, Trevlian. Me. I will not forgive you for this, Adam. And we I will not forget. If all you want is peace, I ask. Then why hide the truth from me, from all of us? Why possess Christian and make him a threat? We I cannot reveal the truth until someone asks for it, replies the voice. Christian asked. I, I do not know why. But in reply, I showed him the vision of Olga of Kief. Unlike you, he saw her face. He saw the hatred there. The hatred for my people. And Christian's heart was filled with nothing but sorrow and compassion. In this moment he was weak. And we I possessed him. We I took no pleasure in this. But we I did what I had to. For my people. Why? I shout out into the night. Adam Smith turns to me in shock, but he keeps reading aloud from his book. He cannot hear the voice. Why would you do that? I turn from the Drevlian horde below and look again at the great shadow with its silvery eyes. It slowly looks down at one of its hands with a sound like the distant rumbling of thunder. Because his hands dig faster than ours, comes the reply, and I see in my mind's eye the hole that the Trevlians stuck with their shadowy fingers in the meeting room floor. You cannot be the spirit of your people, I mutter through clenched teeth. I refuse to believe that the spirit of an entire race could be so callously cruel to trick a man into empathy, then using him and disposing him like a tool. I do not know what you are. But I will not grant you access to this outpost. Not tonight. I lift my head and shout out loud into the night, my voice carrying up off the storm. Now, Elena! Now! Fire the weapon!
the so-called spirit of the Drevlin, with its attention fixed wholeheartedly on myself, rumbles with the ethereal thunder and shifts its gaze over the roof of the outpost, its silvery eyes shining in the darkness. Its movement, however, as all its movement are, is sluggish, slow, far, far too slow. And from the darkness, Alina wrapped in ropes of black to conceal her position, pulls back hard on two simultaneous handles, handles attached to the colossal gun on the outpost roof. An enormous mechanical crunch echoes out from the gears, and my teeth are set on edge with a sudden ringing. For a second or two, it seems as if the very wind itself is sent out in the opposite direction, and the scrambling of each and every traveling is halted as the monstrous weapon finally fires. A blast of heat is sent out in an intense circle of energy. I feel it against my skin, and my hair is whipped back from my head as a ring of light appears at the weapon's barrel, and a beam unlike anything I've ever seen so far explode out like lightning, crackling and tearing through the night towards the mountains and the mist and directly through the heart of the great shadow. A twisted, crackling nervous system is briefly illuminated in white across the shadow's form and it starts to leak out into the air as ink leaks out into water. A terrible scream is sent roaring through the mountains, and the entire horde of demons below burst at once into clouds of shadow and bones as the enormous spirit collapses down and into itself, wounded and destabilized. Dust and steam is sent blasting out in all directions. Snow is disturbed and sent tumbling down the peaks. But we do not leave our stations. The traveling horde is displaced, and the giant spirit stays hidden away. But after a few hours of interlude, the attackers do return. They do not come as a tide though. They do not flow like water. They come alone or in small groups. Their fight and their power has been taken away. For this night at the least, and they are easy to deal with, far far easier. And we continue our battle until the rising of the sun, the outpost successfully defended and kept from even a single breach. I turn to Adam as the sun rises. He is white with shock, eyes wide, his hands shaking. I clap him on the shoulder. The veins in my forearms all popped from the exertion. Good work tonight, man. Good work. Now come on, let's go. It's time to get some sleep. And away we go. My story is trying to a close now. Just a little more to wrap up. I remained at the outpost for another couple of days. I did my duty and I defended the place as best as I could. The Trevelyans did not return in any kind of number to equal the night that the tower fell, and I would wager that that could be thanks to our successful surprise attack on the spirit itself, if indeed a spirit he actually is. He will be more cautious in the future. I remained at the outpost until Christian's replacement arrived, a woman from Missouri and since my departure synced up with April's, as scheduled, the two of us hit it out together after saying our goodbyes. A hug from Charlie, a handshake from Adam Smith, a muttering nod from Yuri, and even a flicker of what might have been a half smile from Elena. A sad smile, but a smile nonetheless. I still struggle with the morality of my role in the outpost of what I did between those mountains, whether I was in the right by fighting back against the traveling souls, or whether I should have just stood down and allowed them to return to what they crave so desperately. I still think about them, you know, of those cursed, forgotten people, trapped in their endless cycle of desperation, and the outpost guardians, likewise trapped in their own cycle of grim and gruesome defense. Constant ceaseless stress, night after night, battle after battle on the mountainside. I wonder 
how far the spirit of the Trevelyan would go to achieve his goal. I wonder how far Elena would go to maintain hers. Hell, do the horde of the Trevelyan souls even know what they're fighting for anymore? Do tonight's roster of the outpost soldiers for that matter. It's been months since April and I departed together. Charlie would have left by now. Yuri too, most likely. Not Elena, though. Not Elena. I suppose she's still there, doing her duty. I looked back one final time as we departed the outpost, April and I, clambering over the waist-high wall of the edge of the courtyard. And to my surprise, the first thing I noticed was the flags. Upon my arrival, only the Russian flag flew proudly. The others, the American, the British, the Norwegian, and the NATO, they were old and worn, ragged and weather damaged. But I realized then, at the moment of my exit, that someone had replaced them. I don't know who. I don't know how exactly. I don't know exactly when. But one of my comrades must have taken the time to replace them. Or even fix them up, perhaps. The flags waved proudly in the breeze. Bright shades of red, of white, and of blue. Side by side. Together. I mentioned this to April in the helicopter ride back to the Euro's base. And she nodded. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that too. She said. But there was still something on her mind. I could tell. And I asked her to share with me. Old Gov Keith, she said, thoughtfully after a moment. I never got around to sharing this with you. But I read something interesting about her in that file. The one Yuri showed us. Do you remember? The nights we confronted Elena? Uh, I found something. Something very interesting indeed. Oh yeah? I replied. What was that then? She changed her name, you know. Olga, I mean. As she grew older. So the records say. Is that so? I asked her, cautiously. And what did she change it to? April looked up at me. As the helicopter passed over the peaks. To Elena. I consider this in silence. Silence, but for the monotonous buzz of the blades, whirring round and around as the chopper carried us away through the sky. It's a common enough Russian name, I replied uneasily. Yeah, April sat back, shifting in her seat. A common name. Still, I murmured. Still, she repeated, and we said nothing further for the rest of the flight. I saw her that night in my dreams. Elena. She stood atop the outpost, commanding its enormous rooftop weapon and pulling back on the handles. That powerful circle of the light had the barrel and giving way to the dazzling blast of the beam. To right the sins of the past, came her voice as a whisper on the wind, and her ropes were blown about her as the snow whipped up into a torrent. She looked at me, her eyes alive with glittering eyes, and in that moment, they were the same. Olga of Keith, and... Elena of the outpost.